Welcome to tonight's meeting of the Port Phillip City Council. The City of Port Phillip respectfully acknowledges the traditional owners of this land, the people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their elders past and present. We acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. This meeting is being conducted in a hybrid style and is streamed by Council's webcast page and Facebook Live. Streams and recordings of Council meetings are copyrighted and cannot be altered, reproduced or republished without the permission of Council. If we experience any technical difficulties this evening, we will adjourn the meeting for a short time to resolve the issue. I remind attendees that any member of the public addressing Council must extend due courtesy and respect to Council and the processes under which it operates and must take direction from the Chair whenever called on to do so. Speakers must re remain respectful and statements or questions must not be defamatory, offensive or objectionable, aimed at embarrassing a counselor, counselor or a member of council staff or relate to a matter outside the powers of the council. The first item tonight is request to attend by electronic means. CEO, do we have any requests from councillors to participate in tonight's meeting by electronic means? Thank you, Mayor, and through you, no, we don't. Delighted to say we're all here tonight, including our newest councillor back on Australian soil, Councillor Robert Nyagui. Robbie, sorry. <laughs> Welcome. Family's all here. So I've already gone through apologies. We're all here, so no apologies tonight. On to minutes. Councillors, the minutes of the council meeting held on the 1st of March 2023 have been circulated. Are there any questions regarding these minutes? I see none. If not, yep, councillors, do we have uh, someone wants to meet this? Councillor Martin, anybody second? Councillor Pearl? I'll put that to a vote. All in favour? Thank you. That's passed unanimous. Thank you. Next, declaration of conflict of interest. Does anyone have a conflict of interest in a matter being discussed at tonight's meeting? See you. Uh, through you, Mayor. Thank you. I'll be declaring a potential perceived and general conflict of interest for item 12.2, Palace Foreshore 2324 event proposal and 2022 event review, and item 17.2 in the confidential agenda, Palais Theatre and Luna Park precinct revitalisation. Due to my wife's employment um, and business interests, um, she has dealings with Live Nation, uh, sometimes as a customer, sometimes as a competitor, and therefore I will be excluding myself from that discussion. Thank you. Any other conflicts of interest tonight? No. Next we move into public question time and submissions. Tonight we have 15 speakers, some virtual, some in person, so the time limit will be two minutes. We'll get started. Uh, the first one is virtual, so we'll just start with that one. I call upon Marcus Diamond submitting a question to Council. Do we have Marcus? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi Marcus. Can you say your name and suburb for the record and then you have two minutes? Okay, my name is Marcus Diamond and I live in Huntley Road, Elwood. Great, go ahead. Okay, and I, um, I'm representing a group of um, residents that live around us um, in regards to um, a notice of decision to amend application 1120-2014-A, which is in effect the notice to allow the removal of a large significant gum tree at the rear of 118 Glen Huntley Road. Um, it would appear from just my reading of the process at Council that we're probably now too late for petitions and um, online um, petitions, but, but we, we, we will be submitting those. Because, I mean, we're not clear, but it looks like we have to go to VCAT to make any sort of um, um, application to have this reversed. Anyway, I'm here to um, talk about the native gum tree at the back. Um, we have been... We've had a number of petitions since 2015, and it was declared by the council as significant, and uh, the planning permit at the time was denied, and it was classed as significant. Um, and a, a requirement to protect the tree was put on it during the construction and um, sensitive practices. Um, unfortunately, a large drain was subsequently dug into the root zone 
of the tree and it has slowly deteriorated, although it still has periods of very good health, which it has right now. Um, so we... I've got some writing here. I'll just make sure I've read it. The planning department now has sent a formal notice um, to the most recent objectors, which are 14 of us, uh, to grant a permit to remove the tree and enable vehicle access. Apparently the arborist did not agree with the removal of the tree, but it's been um, going to be removed in lieu of a car park. Um, last night, when we were getting some of our petitions signed, we met a resident at the back who's lived with that tree for 30 years and was pretty appalled. Um, and, I, and just in context, um, we've lived here all our children's lives, and we have a 20-year-old daughter, nearly 21, and an 18-year-old son, and all they've ever seen in the southern aspect of looking out their windows is that gum tree. Thank so you, Marcus. Even though, Sorry, oh, sorry, that, is that it? Yeah, that was two minutes. Do you have a question okay. that you wanted answered? Yeah, yeah um, pretty much. Um, is, there, is there some sort of policy in council that um, would remove a significant tree that's already been protected for a car park? And is, is there a process where we, if we had a significant number of residents that wanted that tree saved, is there still a process we can go through council rather than through VCAT? I refer to Brian T to provide an answer. Thank you. Um, and through you, Mayor, <clears throat> Council has uh, issued a decision um, and there is uh, no uh, capacity for that decision to be revoked other than through an application at VCAT. Um, I would indicate in this matter, Council had to balance the competing interests of a a residential car park that was effectively a residential car park that was unable to be used because of the location of the tree, uh, with that of the significant uh, amenity and environmental impact of um, that tree, which was which is large in size. The decision of council uh, is to allow the removal of the tree. Um, uh, provided that, uh, and there is a condition of the permit which requires that a new tree of uh, which will grow to 10 metres be planted on the property um, as a way in which council has sought to balance the two competing outcomes. Thank you. I call upon Rocco Soros speaking to item 7.2, Petition Ag Ag Advocacy, we'll get there, on short-term accommodation. Testing one, two. Yes, so name, suburb, and you have two minutes, please. My name's Rocco, and I'm from St Kilda, and I'll be quick. <laughs> so I'll try to. Um, dear councillors, mayor, and local residents, and CNO, and CEO, I was here two weeks ago talking about the negative effects of short-term accommodation on our residents and local, um, and the lack of local and state laws to protect protect us. I'm here to ask for help for you to lobby and join other councils in the Metro Nine um, Nine Group to create fit for purpose state law. I'm I'm speaking on behalf of my petition, which is a large group of our community who shared horrific stories on how short term rentals affect their right to enjoy the peace of their own home. And these residents are from all suburbs of the city of Port Phillip. Not just, it's not just a St Kilda problem. Residents of freestanding houses and apartments are equally affected by apartments and houses turned into party houses, catered for hens, bucks and other parties. I'm the voice for people who have either given up or moved on after suffering without anyone responsible to turn to on these short-term rentals and these unregulated business models that are not answering to anyone in terms of sound pollution, number of patrons, age limits, operating hours, which I said two weeks ago. The current state laws are not protecting local residents. Not one host has been fined or suspended in VCAT. The key four policies I would like you to lobby for us, which I um, there's over 80 people that signed my petition. I only needed five. Local owners, corporations, lot owners decide if their building will have short stays. A day cap. Limit the number of days of apartments can be short let. Registration, which is important. Short-term hosts must be registered their, register their business so they are accountable and contactable. Penalties. Regulations that only 
um, that work that are consequential for breaching the rules. Penalties must be enforceable by VCAT. The other main issue, or the other issue, that affects short-term rentals are affordability, housing affordability and long-term rental to our city. To finish off, this is a problem caused by short-term flat platforms worldwide, and you must read the article which I mailed to you, probably lots of emails, sorry. <laughs> Please put your submission and join other councils at the M um, MAV in Victoria to help lobby. Um, there's no accountability and Mornington um, has um, led the way, but we need to learn from what's working and not working. Thank you. Thank you, you Rocco. I call upon Brad Avery. That was just more of a submission, no question, yeah. I call upon Brad Avery speaking to item 12.1, draft St Kilda Live Music Precinct Policy 2023. Hello, Brad. Hello. Hi, I'm Brad. I'm from uh, Fitzroy Street, St Kilda. Great. Um, okay. Will the council consider adjustments in the SEP and two limits to be included in the draft music policy? And in addition to that, will the policy outcomes include also um, in relation to the agent to change existing properties to be um, modified as well, rather than just new residential apartments to be included? Lauren, Lauren would you be able to speak to this? Adele, Adele Denson, thank you. Hi, through you, Mayor. SEP N2 is a state government legislative piece, and so Council don't have any control to amend that as part of this policy, but potential next stages of the live music precinct would be advocacy and collaboration with state government to look into exactly that sort of regulation. And uh, with the agent of change, by nature, that only impacts properties who are changing, so existing properties wouldn't be affected. It would relate to any new developments or new venues. OK, no problem. Thank you. Thanks. I call upon Janet Rosenberg speaking to item 12.1, draft St Kilda Live Music Precinct Policy and the 12.2 Palace Foreshore Live Event. So because you're speaking to two, let's do two minutes for each, but if there's a question, we'll pause, take that, and then do the second one. Is that all right? Hi, I'm Janet Rosenberg. I'm from um, the president of the Ackland Street Traders. Um, on 12.1, the Ackland Street Traders support commencing community consultation for the St Kilda Live Music Precinct policy. Live music has always been part of St Kilda's history. The arts culture here is well established and brings benefits to the whole community. Visitors who come to be entertained come early to dine and drink and also to spend at our many retail outlets. A flourishing music industry here will not only enhance St Kilda's reputation as a cultural and creative hub, but stimulate its economy and restore it to its former glory as one of the best entertainment areas to visit in Melbourne. Streamlining and simplifying the burdens of regulations on live music venues is desirable. It establishes certainty for existing venues and will also encourage new venues to open up in the area. This will protect the live music scene into the future. This policy also seeks to balance the needs of residents and other businesses with clear guidelines of how to coexist harmoniously. There has been a trend in the last few years for our music lovers to move north of the Yarra, where there are many small music venues. We need to provide a vibrant alternative with new and emerging artists able to perform in many places here and re-establish St Kilda as a home of live music in Melbourne. And we need to make it easy. The recent St Kilda Blues Festival is a great example of how St Kilda benefits from music events in the precinct. The precinct was alive with music, people dancing, enjoying themselves and spending time in businesses everywhere. There was a huge increase in patrons to the area and business was increased dramatically. The feedback was incredibly positive with a fantastic vibe in the area. There is already a well-established music scene here. More than 70% of live music venues in Port Phillip are located in St Kilda. They are supported by the Council's well-established live and local website, which links venues and local, mu local musicians. St Kilda is a perfect fit for establishing a live music precinct with its rich, established culture of live music, and the traders totally support this going ahead. Thank you. Spot on. All right. Now you have two more minutes if you have a separate submission for the Palace Foreshore live event. OK. Um, do I have to say my name again? No. Uh, what's the governance rule? No? I think not. Go ahead. Okay. 
So um, feedback from Traders Re last year's music events indicated that all the outdoor music events in the Triangle site increased business substantially in the Ackland Street precinct. There was a noticeable increase in foot traffic and patronage before, during and after the events at both hospitality and retail venues. This increase in visitation added to the vibrancy of the area, reinforcing St Kilda as the heart of the live music cultural scene this side of the Yarra. This year's proposal is for November and March, so should not affect the Christmas summer season and will bring additional patrons to the area in the off season. This exposure through all the marketing of the events is great for our area, especially given the demographic of those that attended last year. These are the patrons we want to see back in St Kilda, enjoying the live music on offer here. There is always concern about the loss of parking, and we know parking is a major issue here. As with last year's event, there needs to be an increase in the available car parking spaces during non-show days and the proposed current footprint on the St Kilda Triangle car park site should remain as it is. It would be of great benefit if more signage was erected, digital or other, to indicate areas where parking is available nearby. This would help reduce negative impacts. There is a lack of awareness of where parking is available in St Kilda, and particularly free parking in the area. Maybe maps of available parking could also be given out when tickets are purchased for the event. It would also appear to be beneficial if the organisers and or council continue to allow Lunar Park buses to drop off pick up in Cavill Street and provide alternative parking for the buses, as I believe was done last year, if this was seen as helpful. Any well-advertised music events in our precinct adds to the vibrancy of the area. They increase footfall and have a positive flow-on effect to the businesses and therefore are to be encouraged. Thank you. You're very good in your timing. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Janet. All right. I call upon David Blakely, Fitzroy Street Business Association, speaking to item 12.1, draft music, draft St Kilda live music precinct policy, and 12.2, Palace Foreshore live event. Same thing, two minutes for each. Thanks. Okay. David Blakely, St Kilda. I'm talking today for Fitzroy Street Business Association. Um, I was talking to a local recently about the history of live music, and live music most people are mistaken it goes back 30 years. It goes back over 100 years. You know, from the jazz era to the dance halls, the Victorian era, etc. I was talking to one of the elders of the local the land we live upon here, um, and she corrected me. She said, David, there's been live music on Victoria Street for 40,000 years. <laughs> um, the, 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 this plan will, give, will remove the complexity that businesses face at the moment. Um, it will streamline things and hopefully that will lead to more investment as it has in Fortu Valley in Queensland. Live music, although people talk about the live music moving to the north, we still, most of Melbourne's population lives to the south of the Rip River. Um, it's what personally brought me to St Kilda and it brings a lot of my friends. Um, hopefully this is going to be a catalyst for renewal, renewal and it will also give some peace to the the battle between residents and, and operators into the future. Thanks for that. That's under two. Yep, well under two. Good job. I'll and start the timer again. Just make sure you're fair. Go for it. Okay, sure. Um, the um, trail point to the palace. Um, we, Fitzroy Street saw a direct economic benefit from the palace, um, particularly on the day of is it King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. I've got that out there in the right order, um, where we had a record signing on the street at the bowling club. We saw branded King, King Lizard fans all day long on the street, eating, drinking, etc. Uh, our traders, I would really worry about the economic viability of many of our tra traders if we did not have an active events program over the summer, be it in Kitani Gardens, the Triangle, etc., and also events such as the Blues Fest, as we put ourselves. St Kilda has always relied upon people from the outside coming in to support the local trade. Um, as it, with everything that's done in the inner city, there's always a, a negative effect. Um, I think, confirming with Janet, I would like to perhaps we could explore what the city of Stonington has done down Chapel Street. There's illuminated signs which tell you how many car parks there are. 
We should be grateful all year round because there are a lot of car parks. We're very well serviced by public transport and Uber and things like that have taken a bigger role these days. But there is room to improve. And the event, talk to local, my friends, they thought the event was a great fresh idea for St Kilda. And in reality, we had to keep on freshening up the brand of St Kilda. And so we fully support the palace. I mean, anecdotally, when I walked around Ackland Street on the nights that there was a show on, it was packed. So the theatres, the events have a massive economic impact on our streets and the viability of them. So, so we have full support going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Right on two minutes. Madam Mayor, can I ask Mr Blakely a quick question? Yes. Yep. Mr Blakely, how, how many people that um, patron Fitzroy Street do you estimate park in the Triangle? I know it's a difficult question to quantify, but how, how many of your members are reliant on those car parks and explain the relationship I, to me, please? I wouldn't think many would. Um, it's more the trade coming the other way. Um, Fitzroy Street, as we know, we have our own parking difficulties, um, but there's also parking that people are not aware of in the area too. So... Um, like the Jackson Street car park is often underutilised because people aren't aware of it's been there. Um, there's some private car parks, the same, same issues. So um, it's about making people aware of the assets that are there. I mean, I think the reality of if it's live music, most people will be taking public transport or Uber. Um, I guess the footprint of the palace, it could be... Um, played with a bit to make it so more palatable to neighbours. Um, but on saying on sign this, when my predecessor, Roger Women, he said one of the biggest downturns on Fitzroy Street was when the old Palace nightclub closed. And it's a different crowd, find a sit-down crowd at the Palais, which is probably in my age, um, to the Palace, which, you know, the, the old Palace idea where it was standing up. So, Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. I call upon Hugh Van Handel speaking to item 12.2, Palace Foreshore live event. Hugh, are you here? Yep. Come on down. Name, suburb, and two minutes, please. I'm uh, Hugh Van Handel. I'm the general manager of Stokehouse Restaurant in St Kilda. Uh, dear Mayor, councillors and councillors, we support live music, but the Live Nation activation of 2022 was a disaster for us. Live Nation failed to keep to their promises and failed to keep to their event quotas. Live Nation lied to the councils, councillors and to local businesses in the gesture spirit of working together. Live Nation in 2022 site occupation was only activated for four out of 40 days, ensuring the site was desolate for 90% of the time. How can we consider a four-day event to be a success at the expense of 40 days trade? By only hosting four out of 11 events, their concert rate of execution was a mere 36% of their original proposal, which is hardly a statistic to be proud of, and if I received this result at school, I would have failed miserably. So why are we continuing to see this event as a success? If we take this rate of success and we apply it to their 2023 and 2024 proposal of 22 events, we can only expect eight events in return out of this proposed occupation of 82 days, ensuring the site is inactive again for another 91% of the time. On the odd chance that Live Nation are true to their word, it will still only activate the Triangle site for 25% of the 82 days period. I'll remind you that this event is intended to activate St Kilda, not to deactivate it. With the recent business losses we have faced through COVID and the deferred business expenses pushed into 2022 and 2023, the foreshore traders and the Ackland Street traders are not in a position to have this car park shut down for 50% of their peak trading window. We cannot stand to allow this event to expand to twice annually. Our ongoing feedback has always been to support the activation of live music in St Kilda and the Council's desire to encourage patronage to St Kilda, but not at the headache or reputational damage or accessibility issues it creates to St Kilda. May I provide Again. four solutions? Um, I'll allow you. Go ahead. Thank you. 
Uh, my first solution here is to host a concert in the Palais Theatre. My understanding is that Live Nation have, uh, to win their contract tender, had a quota of 300 events per annum. They've promised to bring these 300 concerts annually, and with the theatre sitting there empty, why do they deserve to have outside concerts? The second would be to relocate the event to Katani Gardens or South Beach Reserve. If Live Nation can afford 55,000 to rent the car park, surely they can use this figure to restore the lawn at Katani Gardens. The third is to have Live Nation return 200 car parks on non-show days at the Triangle Car Park. The fourth would be to reduce the scope of the site occupation to two weeks per event period. And finally, lastly, I'd just like to ask, why has this public amenity been gifted to Live Nation? And why has this site occupation not gone out for public tender? Thank you. Yes, Councillor Perrell will ask a question. And then I'm going to allow the team, if there's any of those questions you want to respond to, thanks. Gives them a bit of time to prep. Um, how many of those car parks on the triangle do you do you utilise over the proposed timeline that this event's here? Like, give us some. I'd say majority of the days of activation throughout the summer period, our patronage would be upwards of eighty percent. Was that equate to in terms of car cars in the car park that are attending your business? Like, what's the impact? Pardon me. In terms of numbers of cars using the car park and attending your restaurant. What, are we, what sort of numbers are we talking about, do you think, as a rough guess? I think it's hard to quantify, but I think if you look at the total patronage of Live Nation and what they suggested they produced out of four concerts, I'd say very clearly that the foreshore traders can exceed what the Live Nation is producing in terms of attendance to the area. And do you get any benefit at all in terms of the patronage of the temple in... Not, not on our side. Um, I'd say our backs, to a degree, are up against the water and our radius is right in front of us. So this is just a roadblock for us. There's no entrance and exit to our, to our facilities. Um, and then secondly, uh, there was a large portion of the car park that was supposed to reduce last year that never actually reduced. It was actually guarded by Live Nation and security. So the numbers that they said that they would provide back to us were never actually provided. Thanks for coming tonight and thanks for answering those questions. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody like to take up some of the questions that were asked there? Or you think that that statement maybe was incorrect? Oh, sorry. Can we go to... Okay, sorry. If you don't mind holding Lauren, you can still sit there, Hugh. Councillor Crawford, you had a question for Hugh? Um, given that a lot of people have to book for Stoke House, do you give them that information over the phone, like the various parking places, like further down the skate park and Seabards? Do you provide that information to, given that most of the up, uh, upstairs would be booked? Sure. We, um, we actually suggest to take alternative modes of transport because we know that without that car parking, it creates an avenue of congestion. And once everyone comes down thinking they can park and they can't find anything, they circle for 20 minutes, half an hour... They get frustrated and they leave the area. And what that does, it, it just prohibits anyone else from attending because they're stuck in 30-minute traffic. Thank you, Hugh. Lauren, is there something you'd like to add? Any questions? Sorry. Um, through you, Mayor, I'll just try and respond to, to some of it. Um, so last year there were six shows, not four shows. One of those six shows was relocated into the Palais, Palais due to inclement weather. So there were five shows outdoors and one in the Palais. Um, just in response to the suggestions, obviously we've been workshopping all the alternates. Um, the, the idea of this venue is, is to create a standing venue in contrast to the Palais, which is a sit-down venue, which is why it wouldn't work to, to put these shows into the Palais. Um, Katani and South Beach are certainly something councillors could consider if they wish to. Um, Katani would involve a large number of other festivals and events needing to be cancelled or relocated. Um, South Beach, at either, either option would require probably about a month of turf restoration. So um, we've not spoken to Public Alive Nation about the costs of those. It's more an issue of whether the councillors would be happy to see those public spaces out of sort of public use for probably about a two month period. There would need to be a month after the event um, where the turf would be restored and that area would have to be fenced off to the general public. 
Um, so that's not something that the applicant is um, refusing to do, but that's a matter if, if council, council wishes to consider that. Um, our, our understanding, and it's, it's hard without us having conducted inspections on the day together, is that the car parks that were committed to be delivered were delivered. That's, that's our view. We're, we're not aware of um, promises of car parking being provided, not being provided. Um, but again, you know, I, I feel awkward saying this um, with you sitting next to me. We didn't conduct inspections every day, but however, we believe that the number of spaces were provided as promised. Um, the hirer has also um, been clear that they are not able to reduce um, the, the activation to a two-week period um, or to a, a smaller footprint. Um, they do require this to be commercially viable. It's an incredible amount of infrastructure um, that has to go in and out, so it is an incredibly expensive production to put on, and they do need the number of shows to make that commercially viable. Um, lastly, in terms of the public tender comment, um, any hirer or any applicant is able to make a submission to council through an event permit. Um, we have, we've certainly not received other alternate um, proposals that we have kept from councillors. Um, there's, there's no um, restriction on anyone else um, applying to um, host these sorts of music performances. This is the only application we have received. Thank you, Lauren. Now, councillors, I just want to remind you that this is questions for Hugh at this point. Anything else will be asked questions during the item. So do you have a question for Hugh? This, no? Christina? Sorry, Councillor Sierkoff? Thank you, Mayor. Um, Hugh, I'm just wondering uh, your response to the previous question by Councillor Crawford. Um, you said that you do inform anybody who books a table at your restaurant that they, might, they, might, they may need to find um, alternative um, transport to to your restaurant, um, do you find that this um, deters people from then booking at your restaurant if they can't find car parking using their own vehicle? We're strategic about this. We only deliver that message 24 to 48 hours out. Um, otherwise, sometimes on the day of to ensure that we don't receive cancellations, but that's still an issue. Um, I think one of the main things as well is with a restaurant, you've actually got seating. So we're impacted both lunch and dinner. We're not just impacted on the night that the events are held and we're impacted for the total duration of these events. Uh, one of the other issues that we tend to see is that people are coming, they're late and for a two hour dining window. So if they're half an hour late, they're angry, they're disgruntled. That then gets referred to the wait staff uh, and then pushes back all the second sitting. They then arrive late and disgruntled their booking is late and deterred as well. And so it just impacts us for a tremendous amount of time and adds a huge layer of complexity and stress onto the staff that is otherwise unwarranted. Thank you, Hugh. Now, I know I've allowed a little bit more back and forth than we normally do. I know it's a big topic to businesses, so thank you for coming down tonight. I call upon Angela Dawson speaking to item 12.2, Palace Foreshore Live Event. And you are virtual, yes, Angela? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor and Councillors. My name is Angela. I am from St Kilda. Okay. Uh, we are fully supportive of live music um, events being in our precinct, and we believe that live music is an integral part of St Kilda's history and future. We have many successful live music events that are currently taking place, um, and we appreciate that it drives visitation to the area and increases spending with local traders. Unfortunately, the local foreshore traders and the visitors to the precinct were significantly negatively impacted by the 2022 Live Nation event. The reduction in car park spaces not only impacted foreshore customers, but also impacted the experience of visitors to the entire St Kilda precinct. People experienced considerable frustration due to not being able to park. This resulted in guests being late to their bookings. We had many calls saying that people took, it took people up to an hour to find a car park and they ended up parking in West Beach, um, so West St Kilda, West Beach, and walking in, and we had a number of bookings that were cancelled. Hosting large-scale events in populated areas come with positives and negatives, and in this instance, the pros did not outweigh the cons it is unacceptable for traders to wear the damage to their brand and the brand of the city. 
The primary reason for this brand damage was that the number of events, five events, and the car park was actually closed for 44 days and nights. Um, the other thing that I would like to mention is um, the, the fact that we are pushing um, large scale events into a, a period period of trade within our precinct that already has a number of road closures and uh, major sporting events. So if, for example, we look at March, um, there is already a number of um, triathlons that are happening that are closing our roads. Um, those triathletes and their supporters, they drive in. They don't ride their bikes in before they do a, a triathlon. And then we've also got a major car park closed. So for me, it just doesn't make sense that we are keep funneling people into our precinct without providing the appropriate amenity for them to be in that space. So I ask the question, um, you know, is it appropriate to have our major arterials closed, our major car park closed, and to continue to push thousands of people into our precinct you know, that our precinct is, what, a one kilometre radius without, you know, providing them the appropriate amenity for, for them to be in there. Thank you, Angela. That's well, a question that I don't, ha I can't have officers answer, but that's something the councillors can take into consideration in their vote tonight. So thank you for coming tonight, or coming online tonight. I now call upon Mary Stewart speaking to item 12.2, Palace Foreshore Live Event. Uh, thank you, um, Mayor and Councillors. Luna Park has um, previously put uh, a number of submissions to Council regarding uh, the closure of the St Kilda Triangle Car Park uh, for extended periods of time. This is not an academic issue for us. It has a significant material impact on the capacity of Luna Park to trade during critical um, uh, summer periods where we operate um, and have to be able to generate a sufficient amount of revenue to carry our uh, operations and our staff uh, through the lean cash flow negative months of winter. We trade significantly cash flow negative over winter. And if you don't make enough money in summer, you can't survive. The event on the St Kilda Triangle car park last year had a negative impact on us. It occupied the Triangle Car Park for uh, a, a significant number of days. I accept that there was a benefit to the Akron Street and the Fitzroy Street traders for uh, five of those days. We suffered every day, every day. We had cancellations, we had disgruntled guests attending at the park, we had people not being able to get to events uh, and corporate events that were booked into the park. And I was one of the people who sought to park in the space behind the Palais Theatre on a day when that area was supposed to be open to the general public to park. I was turned away by security guards from Live Nation who told me that I was not allowed to park there. I made an attempt, whether or not it got through or not, to contact the council and ask them to come down and to police what Live Nation was supposed to be providing. That did not happen to me just once. Mary, thank you. That was two minutes that was allowed for speaking time tonight. Do you have any questions? Actually, I have a councillor wanting to ask you a question. Go ahead, Councillor Clark. Can you hear? Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mayor. I just want to ask you, Mary, there's been a reference to Luna Park having access to buses and parking in Cavill Street. Is that something you see as a benefit to getting um, people to Luna Park or 
Yeah, what's your view on that? Thank you, Councillor. The buses were provided last year because uh, in December um, we have an extensive program of schools that attend the park during uh, the week. And we can have 10,000 to 12,000 students uh, booked into the park in those three weeks of December. And the bus parking that was provided uh, in um, uh, some way away uh, helped on some of those days that were not the busiest days. There were a number of days where there was insufficient parking for uh, the school buses. Uh, they typically drop people off in Cavell Street, their students off in Cavell Street. In previous years, they would then circle through uh, behind the Palais Theatre and park in the St Kilda Triangle car park. That area was blocked off. And um, uh, so this, this year's proposal does not cut across uh, to the same extent the school's activity program at Learner Park in December. It still cuts across a number of the corporate events uh, that are booked into the park in um, November, and it would have a massive impact on our Halloween program. Um, and also at the other end, it would have a significant impact on Easter, our Easter trade, both of which are critically important to our economic viability. Thank you, Mary. I call upon Penny Flanders speaking to item 12.2, Palace Foreshore live event. Penny, if you'd like to come up, name, suburb, and two minutes, please. My name's Penny Flanders from St Kilda. Um, I am here on behalf of both Luna Park um, and also as a long-term resident of St Kilda who lives near the park. I have a statement to read out on behalf, again, of Executive Director Mary Stewart at Luna Park. Dear members of the Council, Luna Park urges to vote against the permit submitted by Public and Proprietary Limited in its current form. We urge councillors to consider the relocation of the music event into Katani Gardens over a shorter time frame. Luna Park's not opposed to cultural, musical and theatrical events holding place and having a benefit for local St Kilda area. However, the commercial impacts of these events need to be seriously considered, including the need for carefully close consultation with the impacted business and the locals. The event permit proposed has detrimental impact on the essential public parking space and the essential public amenity with the intention of removal for two prolonged periods of time. Many public open spaces can be used without reducing those public parking amenities. Luna Park supports the outdoor music events and believes they just don't need to use the St Kilda Triangle car park, reducing that capacity and at the same time undertaking activities to bring more people into the areas designed to have a negative impacts on affected businesses. So you're not just approving Live Nation on two singular month basis. This is for 38 days in October and November and 44 days across February, March and April. Bump in for the first session will occur during the Halloween season in October. Uh, March will then occupy a time frame across our Easter school holiday period. Both of these periods have significant impact on the capacity to trade. In summary, we believe that it would be more appropriate to locate the event to Katani Gardens. This would leave the car park available for the benefit of all. We certainly support live music and understand the difficulty for all of the businesses through this current uncertainty. We'll support more activities and outdoor music events. All we ask is that you do not do it at our expense and we urge you to consider our proposed solutions or vote against the report's recommendation. Thank you, Penny. I call upon Joanne Bainbridge, speaking to item 12.3, Business Parklet Guidelines. Hi, Joanne. Name, suburb, and you have two minutes, please. Yep, it's um, Joanna Bainbridge. Oh, sorry, it's written wrong here. Sorry, Joanna. That's okay. Oh, good. Um, and I'm from Middle Park. 
Um, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, I would like to ask Council to not allocate any car parking spaces in the Middle Park Village to parklets. Um, we're blessed with nice wide footpaths in Armstrong Street with plenty of room for seating that many of the traders, um, both food and alcohol traders, um, take advantage of. We love this aspect of our village, the alfresco nature, and this type of seating does not cost us um, our car parking spaces. Um, there are 65 usable spaces in front of the shops between Canterbury Road and Neville Street. Um, the proposed 14 parklet spaces represent 22% or one-fifth of our eligible parking. This seems excessive. Um, we've got to ask about the consistency in the guidelines as the whole of Fitzroy Street only had nine car parking spaces allocated to parklets. Seems odd. Um, we parklets severely restrict um, local residents from parking in front of their houses, those that are west of Richardson Street, and it disadvantages customers and traders who cannot find a park when they visit the local shops. Furthermore, parklets could pit trader against trader, those who have more space to serve customers against those who lose business due, due to loss of car parks. We've spoken to two traders serving food and neither of them want the, par the parklets and are incensed at the idea that loss of um, parking could adversely affect their business. Parklets may have worked during COVID, but COVID is over and we want our car parking spaces back. We love our village, our home, and we will fight to preserve our amenity, peacefulness and heritage. Please help us to conserve our unique village. All we want is that we want it to be bustling and vibrant but we don't want to see the essence to be destroyed by over or inappropriate development that disadvantages the residents. And can I please reiterate that um, Middle Park is not St Kilda. We are a residential village. That is what we are. That's what we want to stay as. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. I call upon Helen O'Sullivan speaking to item 12.3, Business Parklet Guidelines. Hi, Helen. Um, good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Helen O'Sullivan. I actually live in Armstrong Street in Middle Park. And I, too, would like to talk to the um, recommendation that has been made in the draft guidelines for parklets. That recommendation, as Joanna just said, um, suggests 14 in Armstrong Street. Um, I... Um, um, would like to build on what Joanna has said. And so I went to the executive document that was provided to the councillors as part of your recommendation. And I looked at a couple of things. The first um, uh, purpose of the guidelines was local traders to grow their patronage and increase the uh, visitations to the municipality. That is something we would all love. The other purpose for the guidelines was to as well as having high quality dining, um, a healthy and vibrant neighbourhood shopping, shopping strip in our community. It seems to me that unfortunately the introduction of 14 parklets um, is to the advantage of the seven dining um, businesses that are in our street, but not the 35 other businesses that require people to come and visit and therefore parking such that they can visit those stores. So I would like to really stress that if you're looking at, as your goal says, um, servicing all the local traders, then I think it's really important to recognise that there are many other local traders, there's a pharmacist, a doctor, a significant number of local traders that will be significantly disadvantaged along with the community because if we can't have people parking there and using those facilities, they will move on. As we all know, Albert Park's not very far away and has the same sorts of opportunities. So I would really urge you, in looking at your guidelines, to really not accept the recommendation for, for Armstrong Street in Middle Park. Thank you. Perfect timing. Thank you, Helen. I call upon Adrian King, speaking to item 12.3, Business Parklet Guidelines. Good evening. Hi. Uh, name's Adrian King. Live in Middle Park. Um, I have two topics. The first one is how are the number of parklet spaces calculated? Um, 
I am going to cite one policy document, the City of Port Phillip 2020 Parking Management Policy Document. Uh, on page 7, it says, with reference to access to parking, when and where it's needed most. It states, ensuring car parking is available to those that need it at the times they need it is critical to making our city livable. I'm now going to quote data from the 2021 census data and also the Victorian Gaming Council. Middle Park has 4,000 residents. St Kilda Central has 19,490. Of that population in Middle Park of 18 to 34 year olds, who would probably form the core of going to bars and cafes, we have 468. St Kilda Central has 7,523 residents aged 18 to 34. 12% of Middle Park's population is made up of 18 to 34 year olds. 39% of St Kilda Central's population is made up of 18 to 34 year olds. That is 16 times more in St Kilda 18 to 34 year olds. Liquor licenses. There are nine bars and cafes and restaurants in Middle Park with a liquor license. There are 174 in St Kilda Central. That is 20 times the number in Middle Park. The number of car park spaces, it is proposed that there be 14 for Middle Park. It is proposed that there be 31 for St Kilda Central. That is two times Middle Park's allocation, yet it has 20 times the number of licensed bars and cafes. Thank you, Adrian. I, saw, I heard questions from the first part. Did you have a question you want to add for that second so my, so my, I was going to, the question really is, so how were the numbers calculated? Yeah, so that was a question I wrote down. Lauren, are you able to answer that one, please? Um, through you, Mayor, it's, it's not a, a simple answer, and I'm happy to um, send you, if I can grab your email, there's a, a three-page um, explanation, so I'm happy to send that through to you. Um, basically, there was no precedent worldwide in, in how to assess these, um, and so the methodology for determining the upper limit um, used a percentage of car parks in an activity centre as a base, then applied modifiers to allow support for additional parklets in locations where car parks may be more valuable, um, for our community is public space, for example, areas with significant additional off-street parking, uh, where narrow footpaths restrict outdoor tradings in activity centres with high vacancy rates, or where there is access to public transport or other safe transport alternatives. But very happy to send you the, the broader methodology that, that has sort of more complex formula. Yes, please. Um, second point. Before you go. Thank you. Um, topic is community input regarding any parklet application. And I'll quote from the Victorian state document using the car park provisions. Is this a question? It's a short statement followed by a question. Can you get to the question? I can get to the question. Thank you. Um, please can you outline the application process as it relates to over-resident community consultation with regard to any parklet application? Um, through you, Mayor, we do not um, conduct community consultation in relation to parklet applications. Um, we have council endorse the guidelines and the policy, and that sets, that sets out the terms and conditions under which we would consider parklets. Could I clarify on that, though? So that's an annual approval for a parklet. So should you receive complaints or something from residents and traders, that is taken into account for future applications? Correct. Through you, Mayor, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. I call upon Alex Makin, speaking to item 13.2, MAV State Council Motions. Thank you. Twice in one month. <laughs> Alex Makin, Port Melbourne. And uh, there's two additional motions I'd like Council to consider in putting forward to the MAV. 
The first motion is to call on the MAV to advocate to the Victorian Government to publish its integrated transport plan as per recommendations via Infrastructure Victoria and its 30-year strategy. The second motion relates specifically to Fisherman's Bend and Melbourne Metro 2. I don't want to speak too much to the second motion, bearing in mind that there's a number of regional groupings that Council may, uh, in its collective wisdom, wish to pursue advocacy around Melbourne Metro 2. The first motion, however, relates specifically to Infrastructure Victoria as per the statutory authority, which is created, was created by the State Government of Victoria, to outline the vision for infrastructure in this state. And it notes that Victoria does not have a publicly available integrated transport plan. The Transport Integration Act 210 requires the Victorian Government prepare a transport plan but does not require it to be published. Infrastructure Victoria is unaware of a single integrated doc document fulfilling the transport plan requirements under the Transport Integration Act of 2010. This is a statewide issue that hampers the ability of local government to plan the future of its communities. We've heard a whole range of discussion points this evening relating to difficulties around access. If, we had the, if the State Government of Victoria provided local government with the foresight as to when it plans public transport infrastructure upgrades and provision, it would make the job of local government, not just this council, but all 79 local governments in this state, it would make their jobs a lot easier from a planning perspective. I urge the Council to put forward a motion to seek the support of fellow councils in calling on the State Government to commit to its obligations under its own Act of Parliament that it passed back in 2010. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Alex. Anybody have a question there? Sorry, Peter. Uh, Mr. Uh, Council Martin, please. Um, you've come to us at the, at, at the very last minute with your proposal, and I'm not saying it's not a worthy proposal. Are you aware of any other councils that are considering this? Because if other councils were putting something like this up to MAV, it would then give our council time to consider its position and develop its own advocacy position um, without being put on the spot as we are tonight. So are you aware of any other councils who are considering this? And as I say, if they are, I'm sure we'd be happy. Well, I can't speak for the council. I would be happy, certainly interested in supporting them if they're already doing it. Thank you, Councillor Martin. To my knowledge, and I've checked the Inner Metropolitan Councils, given that this is obviously an issue that relates primarily to uh, the Inner City of Melbourne and the pressure that uh, a lack of transport planning provides the Inner City in terms of bringing people to and within the municipality. No, I'm not aware of the Inner City Metropolitan Councils for putting forward a motion. I've done a quick check of other councils, and to my knowledge, no, there is not a similar motion that has been put forward. Thank you. Is there another question there? Anyone? Nope. I might foreshadow that I might take those questions up during the item if I know that there's still not much uh, lead time, but if we could discuss it more at the item, please. Thank you, Alex. Pleasure. Thank you. I call upon Caroline McLeod speaking to item 13.4, South Melbourne Town Hall lease. Hi, Caroline. Name, suburb, and you have two minutes, please. My name is Caroline McLeod, um, and I live in Albert Park, and I have been a resident here for over 50 years. Part of that time, I've, for 10 years, I've been a volunteer at ANAM, and really I just wanted to make a few comments about the proposal for the lease um, that I hope all councillors will endorse tonight. Um, as a volunteer, I've so enjoyed being part of the Anam family, and I've often thought I should be paying Anam for the privilege of being a volunteer. But I would really like to um, make a few comments. Um, John Daly, who will be speaking later, who is our chair, and is here with um, Nick Bailey, who is our general manager. I just would like to take um, the opportunity to acknowledge the hard work and dedication of these two men to the spectacular um, pro uh, program that they're proposing, to bring the marvellous project to fruition. Uh, they are men of 
of vision, intelligence, integrity. In other words, ANAM is in very good um, hands. What a joyous occasion it will be when ANAM returns to its rightful home and the cultural hub of the city of Port Phillip is restored. I invite you to endorse the proposal wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. I have Nick Bailey on the list again. Do you want to speak tonight? No, okay. I thought there was a scratch. Thank you. Just... <laughs> Thank you. I call upon John Daly speaking to item 13.4, South Melbourne Town Hall lease. And I believe that's the last speaker, by the way. If anybody is registered that I don't have your paper or know about, please let the team know. All right, John, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is John Daly. I'm the chair of the Australian National Academy of Music and a resident of South Yarra. I'm here to support the proposal for Council to agree to work with ANAM to rejuvenate the magnificent South Melbourne Town Hall. It's a big commitment to the future. Many of the musicians who will train in this building under this lease have not yet been born. Um, I'd like to thank the council officers um, for the very hard work that they've put in to kind of devise this lease and negotiate its terms. Uh, a 50-year lease is a complicated document, inherently so, uh, even more so when there's lots of building to do uh, and it has taken time and COVID, frankly, didn't help. But getting the details is, right, uh, is important for all of us and I think we've got the details right. The money that ANAM is proposing to invest under this uh, agreement um, will deliver two state-of-the-art performance venues, uh, not just for ANAM, but for dance, for drama, for comedy, for receptions, a catering kitchen for functions and events, a much better foyer that will also open the front doors of the building, a green building uh, with solar power, improved insulation and energy efficiencies, and heritage-based refurbishments. The lease commits ANAM to providing discounted rates for community hire at the public facilities, um, a cultural fund through which uh, a dollar for every ticket sold will go towards um, uh, cultural activities in the area. And we're also going to provide much needed office space uh, for small to medium cultural organisations. Um, we're really keen to come home to the South Melbourne Town Hall. ANAM is a world class uh, academy and it will be great to be, make the South Melbourne Town Hall a world class building that's appropriate for it. We're also looking forward to welcoming local audiences back to the Town Hall for more decades of fabulous music. Anam believes that without a broad and deep community of listeners, there's not much point in having music. We're also looking forward to returning to the South Melbourne um, community. For the past 15 years, Anam's musicians have been teaching in local primary schools, performing in nursing homes, uh, and contributing to community festivals. It takes a village to grow a musician, and our musicians have to play a role in the South Melbourne village. We think that obviously all of this activity from ANAM, from community groups and so on is going to make a really big difference in terms of rejuvenating the local retail and hospitality industries. In short, the proposal before Council is to make sure that Emerald Hill is an important gathering place for culture as it has been for tens of thousands of years. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right, that was the end of the speakers, so we're going to move into councillor question time. Councillors, does anybody have a question tonight that is of a generic uh, question, not to any item that we're debating or voting on tonight? Councillor Pearl. Thanks, Madam Mayor. I have two without notice quickly. I don't expect you to have the answer to the first one, but I'd be interested to get an update. Um, could officers provide councillors with an update of the Carlisle Street activation pop-up program from last year that was announced in uh, October, the $200,000 commitment for pop-up shop shops along Carlisle Street, please. Lauren. Um, through you, Mayor, that, that um, activation is in progress and has commenced, but I will get you a full report as to the progress in the various stages. The, don't go to an email would be fine, just the number of shops pop-ups that are in place, the number that have been negotiated and how long you think it's going to take to get the rest of them. Absolutely. Yep, no, no full reports, please. Thank okay. you for that, though. Uh, the second question, if I may, Madam Mayor, is in relation to the um, works relating to the foreshore lighting project, which was um, partially completed a few years ago, and particularly the landscaping components uh, out the front of and around 
the Port Melbourne Life Saving Club. Is it possible for officers to provide an update on the broader foreshore lighting project and also the landscaping components of that project? Lachlan Johnson. Uh, through you, Mayor, I'll be able to provide a brief update and we can provide a more fulsome update in the minutes to the Council meeting. Uh, there's been a number of delays associated with the works along the Bay Trail. Uh, the current works uh, in Elwood uh, have been delayed as a result... Uh, actually, sorry, I'm talking about the wrong project. Uh, the current works uh, in uh, Port Melbourne have been delayed in relation to a fusarium wilt issue, which relates to it's a disease that affects palm trees. Obviously, there's a lot of palm trees along that part of the foreshore. Uh, working through those issues has meant there's been a delay in achieving approval from the state government. A contamination management plan has had to be prepared. This is a prerequisite for DECA granting a Coastal Crown consent for the works to proceed. We realistically anticipate that construction is going to commence in this space in 23-24, potentially at the end of this year or early into the following year. But we can provide a more accurate uh, update in the minutes. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, we'll move on to the sealing schedule. Councillors, we have no items for sealing on tonight's agenda. That moves us on to petitions and joint letters. Now, I just want to give a little bit um, a heads up. I'm going to move one item up. So we're going to do the two petitions that we have now. And then I'm going to go to item 13.4, which is South Melbourne Town Hall lease after that to bring it up. And then we're going to take a break. Everyone good with that? Okay, so, councillors, we have two petitions and no joint letters on tonight's agenda. The first one is 7.1, Petition Response, Port Melbourne Shared Bike Path Area. Do councillors have any questions of the officers in relation to this item? Okay, I see none. Do I have a mover for this item? Councillor Martin. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Crawford. Councillor Martin, would you like to speak to the motion? <coughs> Firstly, I thank the petitioners for their petition, and I'm well aware of the, the, the points that I make. I think I've met with several of the petitioners and discussed the problems that they have. Can I also thank our officers for their detailed report? And I note that while our petitioners would like the, the application of a 10-kilometre speed limit across the, uh, the, the, the path that runs in front of those buildings at Beacon Cove, um, the officers have raised flags about some difficulties in implementing that and we note that there's a trial currently being conducted by the City of Melbourne. It would be very interesting to see the results of that trial and what lessons that can be learnt and hopefully if their trial is successful we might be able to bring some measures in which will help address the issues that the petitioners quite rightly have alluded to. I use that area myself regularly and I'm aware of the problems. I note that they're asking us to look at signage and that's something else that I'd, lo I'd like to see there. Um, again, we'll see how successful the signage is in the City of Melbourne trial. And again, hopefully there'll be lessons learned and hopefully we'll be able to make a significant difference on the foreshore, even if just um, changing the way people behave by having signs that um, direct them as to what they should do, because I note that our council officers aren't in a position to fine cyclists for speeding. And last but not least, I note the reports on the motorcycle parking and that uh, our officers will be enforcing them. So uh, thank you to the petitioners and thank you to the officers. Happy to move this recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Crawford doesn't want to speak. Anybody else want to speak to the item? I will quickly. I know this area well. I think there are some design flaws where the pavement is continuous and doesn't read very much as a thorough bike path, but the capacity to change out that right now is not the right time. Should there be more works that I hope would be coming to really make this the proper gateway for the City of Melbourne through our busy cruise ship arrivals area, maybe we can address things like that in a future budget. And the, as Councillor Martin said, taking more note of motorcycles parked illegally, it will be done, uh, but park, parking of motorcycles in those areas is still allowed under the policy right now. Um, there is a separate walking path, and I think people need to be very mindful when crossing the bike path that there can be people who are not following the rules and always be very aware of your surroundings. And that's not a, a cop-out. It's more just 
the awful part that we can't, the police need to enforce it and they're not everywhere at all times, but we do take the safety of that area and people getting around, sharing the space seriously. All right, we're going to put that to the vote, unless somebody else wants to speak. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. The second petition tonight is 7.2, Petition on Short-Term Accommodation. Councillors, please note that the recommendation for this item is to receive the petition with the response to be provided at a future meeting. All right. Councillors, do we have any questions of the officers in regards to this item? I don't see any. Do I have a mover for this item? Councillor Pearl and a seconder? No. Councillor Martin? All right, Councillor Pearl, would you like to speak to it? I'll reserve, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Martin? Thank the petitioners for their petition. Thank the officers for accepting the petition. I note that there is no immediate action from our officers because they're going to need time to consider what we can do. We looked at this issue when we were looking at our local laws and we couldn't find a way, as we explained in the chamber two weeks ago, about what we could do um, simply by adjusting our local laws with the difficulty of implementing any changes. But we do have a motion coming up later this evening which picks up on a number of the issues that the petitioner have mentioned. It's a recommendation to the MAV to lobby with the other inner suburban councils to the state government to change the legal framework under which Airbnbs and similar um, accommodation places operate. And I also note that under the MAV rules, um, there are a couple of items that the petitioner has brought to our attention that aren't included in that motion that's coming up later tonight. And with the motions that go before the MAV, once the motion is tabled, we can then make some modifications to our original motion. So no doubt working with our officers, we may well be able to modify that motion, perhaps in the light of some of the comments that the petitioners have made. And then last but not least, I'm sure our officers will be working diligently to see what we can do locally, even without the support of the MAV. So again, thank you for the petition and hopefully we'll be able to get some action for you. Thank you. Any other councillors want to speak to this item? Councillor Baxter? Yeah, just to thank the uh, petitions and um, essentially, yeah, we, we as councillors have had a, a conversation around this. We have some difficulty in terms of what we have available to us under a local law. Um, and so I, I think really the conversation will need to be uh, about advocacy. As w I'm sure there are some things we can do locally, but I think the vast majority is going to be um, uh, at a state level. Um, and so uh, just a foreshadowing, I suppose. Um, I do have a notice of motion for the next council meeting um, that to uh, call for a report to get some more information uh, f from different local governments uh, across Australia in terms of how they handle this in different regulatory environments, as, you know, outside of Victoria as well, um, that, so that we can really start to um, get a good idea of what the strongest um, and, and best uh, avenues for advocacy could be. Thank you. Any other councillors speaking to this item? I will quickly. Thank you for sending some intriguing articles. It has a lot of food for thought. Uh, around the world, there's different government structures. What they're doing may be a little bit easier to implement or enforce if they run their police, for example. But there's a lot there that we can look at. It will be hard to lead the way, but it's something that we hear the residents asking for. So thank you for bringing that. Would you like to close? Thanks, Madam Mayor. So I had COVID two weeks ago, so I dialed into the meeting and I had a few days off my esteemed council duties and I logged in my email and... Sorry. Wow. <laughs> it was like a week's worth of reading from Rocco. So I, I, I'm now uh, well-versed on um, everything you're passionate about and that's a good thing. And thank you for doing so. So in, in terms of you educating yourself, you've also educated this group of councillors. Um, Airbnb provides a wonderful opportunity for our community, both from an economic point of view and a social point of view. Uh, the, the, the diversification of accommodation, particularly in the South Melbourne, Albert Park, Middle Park, and to a lesser extent, Port Melbourne area, has meant that our shopping strips and a number of our local businesses have flourished in a way that they couldn't have and wouldn't have in the past. Uh, that's an important thing because it brings a very different type of daytime economy to our local area and that's something that we should be proud of and we something we obviously support. Having said that, there's always two sides of every coin and the, the other side 
um, is what you and your fellow residents have experienced. Um, and this is a wonderful opportunity for us to fully consider those concerns and what our positioning could be. Uh, we all have our individual views on how this could potentially go, but this is a good opportunity for us to review those and refresh whatever council can do to assist. It would probably be good to um, combine Councillor Bax's initiatives with this motion here. Um, probably a bit short notice to do it as an amendment, but it would be good if that comes as a notice of motion that we combine the two together and we, we, we bring this as a fulsome response when we see you in four to six weeks. So thank you for doing this, as everyone has said, said to you, and it's timely and a good opportunity for us to review where we're at. Thank you. I'll now put that to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimous. Thank you. All right, as I said earlier, we're going to move on to presentation of reports, but we're putting 13.4 South Melbourne Town Hall intention to lease, considering submissions of response at the front. So I'll let everybody catch up. Um, councillors, are there any questions of the officers in relation to this report? Councillor Pearl. Thanks, Madam Mayor. How are we going with the? Well, how how's NAM going with the funding structure for the um, to meet the obligations of the lease? And are we satisfied that um, those funding those funding arrangements are uh, well underway and probable? Okay, I'll refer to Anthony Savinkoff from Council, but if anybody in NM would like to chime in, that would be helpful. Thank you. But Anthony, is there something you'd like to add first as they come down? Just for clarification, Madam Mayor, the reason I'm asking the officers and not NM is I want the officers to be satisfied because obviously that these are conversations we've had with NM. So okay, obviously interested to hear about what NM say, says, but I'm more interested about the verification of what NM said to our officers. Sure. Thanks for the question. Through you, Mayor, uh, officers are satisfied that NAM are working very hard to uh, obtain the, the funding that they'll need and uh, through discussions with NAM it's clear that um, they have received uh, some assurances of, of funding to date. Uh, a key thing to keep in mind is that the lease does not commence uh, until NAM makes the approximately $20 million of contribution to the building. So. Until that happens, there is no lease. Thank you. John, would you like to add anything? Thank you, Mayor, for the opportunity. Uh, so we have $12.5 million from the Commonwealth. Uh, that is an agreement that has been signed, so if you like, the money is ours. Uh, we have another $2.5 million in philanthropic contributions that have already been made. Uh, and then we have been speaking to a large number of philanthropists who have given us um, uh, a lot of reasons to believe that they will be contributing. This is a chicken and egg problem, however. It is essentially very hard to get philanthropists to commit to giving money to ANAM when we don't have a lease. Uh, we expect, or at least an agreement to lease, we expect that if Council agrees to the lease, uh, then we will have no trouble in raising the initial tranche, which I think is slightly more than $20 million, um, uh, well before the lease commences. And indeed, we uh, think it is highly likely we will have substantially more than that. Assuming that that happens, we will do more of the works earlier uh, with all of the benefits that that brings, not only to ANAM, but to the entire community. Thank you. And apologies if I misinterpreted the question there, but thank you for adding extra. All right. Any other questions from councillors tonight? No? All right. I'm looking for someone to move this or something different. Councillor Crawford to move. Councillor um, Nyagui to second. Councillor Crawford, do you like to speak to it? I know that you're looking forward to coming home and we're looking forward to welcoming you. Um, well, I am from I'm hoping that the rest of the council is going to agree with me and vote that way. Um, I remember when you came to us, oh God, however many years ago, um, with the first initial idea, and it just seemed perfect in terms of, and I know there's been a lot of hard work go from both sides, officers, and, and from the ANAM side in the negotiations and in the fundraising. Um, it lines up so much with our vision for South Melbourne and Emerald Hill as that cultural hotspot. Um, and we know it, it's a grand building, a grand lady that needs to be restored and loved. And I, I feel strongly that Anam will love it like we do and the residents of the city of Port Phillip, but particularly of South Melbourne. So I think it's um, timely. I'm hoping that there is general consensus around the table, but I really look forward to that 
to that moment. So hopefully this decision tonight can help you take the next step. Thank you. Councillor Nyagui. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm also really excited to see this hopefully go through Council today. I want to thank Anam and officers for the work they put into this. Um, it's a really exciting um, next chapter for South Melbourne Town Hall. I know there's been a bit of apprehension in some parts of the community about Anam being in South Melbourne Town Hall, but I think the the proposal we have before us this evening provides a really great benefit for Anam, but also a really great provide, uh, benefit for our community. Um, and will mean that that building, which is such an incredible piece of history, will get to glow and continue to be such an integral part of um, South Melbourne and the broader Port Phillip. Um, so, yeah, I'm really hoping our, my fellow councillors will support this proposal today, and I look forward to seeing um, this project unfold over the coming years. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak to this item? Councillor Pearl. Thanks, Madam Mayor, and thanks to the officers for their efforts in negotiating what um, we've said for a long time, I think, is a good quality lease, both for NM, for our, uh, but also for our community and also for Council. These are difficult leases to negotiate, and you don't know how good these things are until 20, 30, 40, if not 50 years down the track. Um, and this council has learnt from the lessons of the past. We've learnt from the St Kilda Marina. We've learnt from a number of different projects which have come past the deaths of these councils over the past decade and incorporate as best we possibly could into this lease agreement. But I think the balance here works, uh, works well, but the proof will be in the pudding in terms of what this building looks like and the level of its community use in the next 10 or 20 years to come. Um, it, it needs more funding commitments from differing levels of government as inflation um, incessantly eats away at all of our money, but particularly these monetary commitments have been made to this building in the past. It, I find it perplexing that the state Labor government won't support this project. Um, everyone says, oh, it's Jeff Kennett's baby. What a lot of rubbish, to be frank. Paul, the, the great Labor hero of the past, Paul Keating, Perhaps I shouldn't bring this up today. It might be a bad day to do that. But the great Labor king of the past, Paul Keating, founded AM, if I remember correctly, in 1994 and worked with the great Liberal Premier, Jeff Kennett, to find them a home which was South Melbourne Town Hall. So it's a true bipartisan organisation uh, and that should be reflected in the, in the funding model given the huge benefit that this organisation and this asset gives to the state of Victoria. So hopefully Nina Taylor can bring a fresh approach to get some money uh, for this fine site. There has been no project in my time on council that has had as thorough community consultation process over rounds and rounds and rounds and proposals than this one. Uh, and I think the fact that we're at the final, well, one of the final junctures here this evening and there hasn't been a, a coffin thrown at us or a... Uh, a huge line to the microphone here this evening would indicate that I think we've done the right thing by our community and we've done the right thing uh, by our future residents also. So, councillors, I think this has the support, but well done to those of you that are on last council and this council. It's been a fairly long journey uh, and hopefully we get to that 20 million, we trigger the lease, uh, we're back in business with each other and this becomes the jewel in the crown of South Melbourne which is a suburb which is re-identifying itself, and this is a key part of that re-identification process. Uh, the population, I keep on saying this, many, many decades ago, over 100 years ago of South Melbourne, was almost 100,000 people, and now it's less than 20,000 people. So it's a very different community now to what it was uh, then, but the uh, fabric of it needs to re-identify itself and I think this building plays a big role of, in that process and uh, let's, um, let's hope that we uh, can start construction on this as soon as humanly possible. I wish NM all the very best in their endeavours to do that. Thank you. Any other councillors want to speak to the item? If not, I will. I love the statement that was um, that many of the people that will train and perform here haven't been born yet. I think we often think about how old am I going to be in 50 years and what am I going to see and what's going to happen. But that future is bright for all these uh, people who haven't engaged with the South Melbourne Town Hall in either a civic fashion or in a performance uh, opportunity that this is presenting. 
Uh, whilst I am supporting this tonight, I strongly hear the 9% opposition with their concerns over access and keeping the local focus. So I know that you have a great proposal and I'm going to be an advocate for that side of it throughout however long I'm involved in council. Uh, I didn't know about NM before I was on council and I've learned a lot and have had an appreciation for the organization. And I think there's a real opportunity for when the lease commences to embrace a little bit more of the city of Port Phillip and constantly bringing that into the organization. Your renders are lovely and I look forward to them coming together to benefit the young musicians, the music enjoyers, and a, a good working relationship with the city of Port Phillip as well for our general community. So thank you for all work by the officers and by Anna to bring this together. Uh, Councillor Sierkoff to speak to it. Thank you, Mayor. Um, when, as we sit here tonight in council, um, I'm really looking forward to when uh, the South Melbourne Town Hall is functioning again so that we can once again have council meetings there. So that's a great, great inspiration for us all and future councillors to enjoying a, uh, a functioning and inviting and a vibrant new building. So I wish you all the best with succeeding in your endeavours to deliver this. Anybody else want to speak to the item? If not, Councillor Croft, would you like to close? I just did want to close. It sounds like they're going to vote the way I hoped. Um, but I did want to mention two things I forgot in my speech. That dollar per ticket that will go to cultural thing. I know what a great thing. I remember hearing about the French film industry doing it decades ago. I know it really does make a difference for our, our local community. So I'm very excited by that. Um, and then the other one is the um, cultural organisation having desks. Thank you. Because we know that many people lost their home as well as you did in that flood. So just thank you for that commitment to the cultural community of the um, city of Port Phillip. Thank you. If no one else wants to speak to the item, we'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimous. Thank you very much. I promised a break and I'm going to deliver on that. So let's take uh, five minutes. Thank you. All right, are we back on? Okay, sorry, that was actually 10 minutes. I should be better about, we all want a little more of a break. Okay, so we're going back to the regular order. We're in the presentation of reports and we will be now on to 8.1 presentation of the CEO report, issue 93. Okay, everyone's caught up where we're at. Uh, Councillors, do we have any questions of the officers in relation to the report? If not, would a councillor like to move this? Anyone, don't jump too quick. Okay, Crawford and Secondary Niagui. All right, Councillor Crawford, would you like to speak to it? I'll reserve. Okay, Councillor Niagui. I'll reserve too. Oh, you can't actually, sorry. Only the person who moved. That's all right. We're all learning on the job. rules. That's all right. So the way it works is the person who moves it has the right to re reserve yeah. or they also get the right to close if should there be four back. You don't have to speak, no. but if you'd like to, now is your opportunity. Oh, well, I'll speak then. Um, it's always exciting reading, reading these reports because it always kind of blows me away the amount of excellent things that our city is delivering. So all I'll say is thank you to the CEO and all of our wonderful staff for delivering all the wonderful things that our city uh, gets to enjoy. Thank you. Councillor Martin? And ditto, but I particularly take a lot of interest in the finance reports, in which I urge... If councillors haven't read them already, I'm sure you have. Those people are out there in Cyberland. Have a good look at them, and you'll see that um, our surplus is significantly greater than was expected. As of January the 31st, we have an $8.5 million surplus, which means that uh, on, on the surface, read the surplus, um, our financial people are doing extremely well. But then you look at other things in there where you see that we're, you know, there's something like $16 million worth of capital works deferred. And when you realise that um, cost of capital works have gone up 20 or 30 per cent. There are all sorts of pluses and minuses. It's going to make the budget process extremely interesting. But for those of you out there who have interest in how council works and its finances, um, the CEO's report is always a good read, but particularly take note of the finance reports and councils will be delving through those as they go into the budget process. Thank you. Does anybody else want to speak to the item? Not closing on that one or reserving? Okay. All right, let's put that to the vote. All in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. All right, now we're on to 
Item 9.1, draft LGBTIQA plus action plan for 23 to 26, endorsed for community consultation. Any questions of the officers on this item? Councillor Pearl. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Under Section 7, which is financial impact, and maybe this policy is getting picked on, um, I don't intend that to be the case, but I'm just wondering, when it comes back, would it be possible to detail in this policy and other policies the total financial impact in the current budget? Like, well, not the impact, but the current budget that's allocated to the policy. Um, it, it, says, it says here that the annual uh, 7.4, the annual operating budget, allocates to activities, etc., in, including, the, in this case, Pride Network and other communities, etc. But as we consider policies, it would be good to actually have the ex existing budget commitment in the financial impact and then any other additional um, impact as a result of passing the policy. Is it possible when this report comes back uh, that we can get that information in the report, please? Oh, Alison Kenwood, please. Through you, Mayor, yes, we can certainly do that when it comes back into chambers. Thank you. Councillor Serikoff, do you have a question? Uh, can I ask a question? Um, use your mic, please, just so online can hear us. Can I ask a question of Councillor Pearl, please? Sure. So, um, Councillor Pearl, were you referring to the initial amount of money that was allocated to this whole um, um, plan being developed, or is this? Or are you talking about a different amount of money? Um, no, yeah. but just to clarify, the question was in relation to the budgetary impact of the plan or policy that's being considered. So, so not actually the development of the policy itself, it's the components of the plan or the policy that are in the existing budget and whether or not there's any additional money that would be required to fulfil that plan or that um, policy that's not expressly included in the plan or policy. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I'm looking for a mover. Councillor Martin, seconder. Nyagwi, all right. Councillor Martin, go ahead and speak to it. So, Mayor, I've been very, very fortunate to be involved in A, the selection of the members of our LGBTIQA Plus Advisory Committee and as a member of that group for the last 12 months, and they are a most amazing group of people. It's been one of the most pleasant experiences of my time on council to be part of them. The Chair and Deputy Chair both were going to be here this evening to speak to the document. They're unable to be here. That's Liam McAuliffe and Sean Williams. But they've given me the statement that they would have liked to... Uh, present to the council. So with your leave, rather than use my own words here, this is a formal statement prepared by the chair and deputy chair of the LGBTIQA plus working party. So here we go. We wish to formally present to you the draft LGBTIQA plus action plan for the city of Port Phillip for consideration from the appointed LGBTIQA plus advisory committee. We understand the importance of this plan from a council that is one of the largest LGBTIQA plus communities in Victoria. Although we are unable to be present in person, we are extremely proud of the presented work that has been achieved by every one of our committee members, along with the collaborative assistance from all of those who have assisted us to date. From our initial meeting on the 14th of February 2022, there's always been a strong, cohesive direction to ensure that this action plan adhered to the following guiding principles. One, human rights and social justice, ensuring equitable systems and policies, along with accessible and responsive services and facilities to improve health and well-being. Two, cohesive, measurable and accountable. Taking a whole of council approach by embedding LGBTQIQA plus inclusive practice as central to everything we do. Three, diversity and intersectionality. Ensuring the diversity of identities, attributes, experiences and abilities are valued and included in the design, implementation and evaluation of council activities. Four, nothing for us or about us without us. Acknowledging and building on the lived experience of the LGBTIQA plus communities, supporting leadership and connection and providing safe spaces to share lived experience. Five, pride and visibility. Celebrating the talent success and contribution of all our LGBTIQA plus family, people and their families, particularly those from emerging groups, upholding their freedom of expression by ensuring protection from violence and threats to personal safety. In conclusion, as a committee, we welcome community feedback of the, for the plan and we look forward to this valuable feedback. Thank you again for this opportunity. That's Liam McAuliffe and Sean Williams.
And again, can I just say it's been a wonderful experience working with them and the officers who've supported us. I look forward to the community um, looking at this document and it may come back even better than the current draft. And a little bit later on this evening, I think we might be welcoming Councillor Niagui to the LGTB IQA Plus Committee as a replacement for Councillor Copsey. And I know there is at least one other councillor who at some stage is very, very keen to be a member of that committee and will try and share the council membership of this group around over the next couple of years, because it is just a wonderful place for us to work. So commend this policy to go out to consultation. Lovely, thank you. Councillor Niagui, would you like to speak to it? Thank you, Mayor. Um, First, I'll say, as a gay councillor, I'm very excited about this, and I won't use that term all the time, but it is, I think, particularly on this item, something that I do want to really um, raise as something that makes me very excited as a member of this community. Um, you know, we have nearly a quarter or over a quarter of our community identify as, as lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, intersex, queer, questioning, asexual, or, or part of the plus, um, and that's a pretty significant chunk of people, and a pretty significant chunk of people that we need to... Um, uh, cater for and, and elevate um, and listen to and, and incorporate. Um, I was really excited when, when I was initially running for council two years ago to sign the Rainbow Pledge. Um, I want to really thank the Victorian Pride Lobby for putting this on the radar of councils across Victoria. Um, they just have done an incredible job and have really pushed this, this um, agenda, this movement forward um, and brought it into a space that we don't often think about. But there's lots and lots of excellent things that local government can do. And that was the thing that really struck me as I read through this report. There's just an amazing number of opportunities for us to um, make uh, queer people safer, to support business, to support our council staff. Um, the list just goes on and on and on. So I'm really excited to put this document out to consultation. And I really look forward to hearing what our community has to say about it. Um, I also, as Councillor Martin alluded, I'm very excited, hopefully later this evening, to be joining this advisory committee. I think they're definitely a very excellent group of people. I look forward to working with them over the coming period of time. Thank you. Wonderful. Would anybody else like to speak to this? Councillor Baxter? Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, I'd, I'd really like to, um, as uh, Councillor Nyagui uh, said, I'd like to thank the, um, the Victorian Pride Lobby for sort of beginning this conversation um, uh, a little bit before the, um, the, the council elections, but certainly during the council elections, um, and putting out the, um, the rainbow pledge um, that many candidates um, uh, and current councillors um, uh, signed uh, and, and agreed to. Um, I want to thank also the councillors uh, here who um, honoured that pledge and, and uh, voted for um, this, uh, this, this committee and the, and, the, and the work that they're doing, uh, as well as the, the uh, really important rainbow tick work that um, we're continuing to do. Um, this, uh, th this is a, uh, an, an exciting um, action plan. Uh, for me, I really feel <laughs> that, you know, as Councillor Nyagui said, I'm going to keep referring to stuff you've said, Robbie. Um, the, we, we have uh, one of the highest concentrations <laughs> of people who identify as any one of the letters in the LGBTIQA+. Um, and uh, we have, you know, we have Pride March, we have the Pride Centre, we have in so many ways um, a strong uh, community who's really proud of who they are. Uh, and I do think that um, this action plan, I wouldn't say it's necessarily revolutionary because our organisation is actually pretty good at understanding the needs of that community, but it is still absolutely necessary and really important for us to um, lay it out there, uh, exactly what we're doing uh, for this community, which is so vibrant and adds so much, um, but uh, has historically and still continues to experience persecution um, and uh, discrimination uh, regularly. So um, this, I think, is, is absolutely wonderful. Uh, I've met the, the, the members of the, um, of the uh, LGBTIQA Plus Advisory Committee, and they're all extremely impressive uh, people, uh, and I'm really pleased with this work and very excited for this to go out to the community. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to the item? No? All right. Let's go ahead and put that to the vote. All in favour? That's carried unanimous. Thank you. Next item is 12.1, Draft St. Kilda Live Music Precinct Policy 2023.
councillors, do we have any questions for the officers on this item? Councillor Sierkov. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the live music precinct draft aims to uh, make uh, St Kilda a thriving live music scene and while at the same time it wants to protect residents and their amenity and enjoyment of where they live, namely St Kilda. Can Council give some assurance or guidance um, how both these can be achieved through this draft? Thank you. Uh, Adele Denison, if you could respond to that, please. Through you, Mayor, that is the, um, I guess, the very foundation of this policy and the way that we intend to future-proof live music in St Kilda is to make it sustainable for everybody that lives there and for the industry and businesses that put it on. So this policy has initiatives including um, reviewing council processes where we regulate live music and where we can simplify that process but also making more transparent processes for where there are issues and how we'll work and partner with our community to resolve them and as well as in later stages advocating to state government for streamlined process to reduce red tape and again simplify that process for community and venues. Yes, follow up question. Uh, does that mean that when it comes to if there are any issues for residents, you know, maybe they live, you know, 100 metres outside of the designated LMAP area, um, does it mean that when they've got any concerns of how the, maybe their amenities being affected, that council then has more control over addressing those issues rather than it having to, say, go to the EPA or um, to some other body? That, um, that was my impression, sort of, um, that it would become more in-house. Ultimately, that's one of the, the um, actions we'd be looking to proceed with if we are successful in advocating to state government, depending on the outcome of community consultation and the planning study that's currently underway to determine the value of actions like that. It will certainly mean that we have established processes in place in dealing with, with such a resident in terms of recommendations we can make to uh, look at the source of the music noise how we can facilitate conversations between that resident and the source of the music noise and uh, provide a one-stop shop within council so improve our customer experience as well so that that customer is fully aware of what is being undertaken to address their concern. Thank you. Any further questions by councillors? No, if not, I'm looking for a mover. Councillor Bond, looking for a seconder. Councillor Crawford. Councillor Baum, would you like to speak to it? Um, yes, I will. It's taken us a little while to get to this point in time, and I'm glad to see this finally um, going out for community consultation and industry consultation, and we get to release the draft live music plan policy 2023 to the community. So what isn't this policy? This policy isn't a vehicle that will increase the permittable levels or noise levels throughout St Kilda. What this policy is, is something that will hope to simplify the planning scheme and the regulatory scheme um, and the different regulatory authorities in regards to live music and I guess the number one complaint with live music is noise um, and bring it all under one planning scheme that is understood by everyone with one um, organisation responsible for that for that planning scheme and for that regulatory framework, and that being council. Um, to give you an explanation of why this is necessary, I'll use a, some real life examples. Um, a couple of years ago, I was called down to a resident or you know, friend resident said, come, "I need you to come down and speak to the owners of Lost. They're having all sorts of issues with their um, with 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 the live music." Um, plans and they've met all these requirements but it's still not good enough. You know, apparently there's still complaints, they're still not compliant. Um, so I you know, made a phone call for council, found out the background, um, went down and met the resident, I met the owner of this business in conjunction with the resident. 
it turns out that this business was completely compliant with all council regulations. This business was completely compliant with all EPA regulations, but what there was was a condition on their liquor licence that uh, no amplified music could be heard on the footpath directly out, outside their, their business, and it was the police that had decided to enforce this condition on their, on their liquor licence. So despite the fact that there were no EPA problems, no council problems, um, liquor licence didn't have a, a problem with it, but the police seemed to step in and, and felt the need to enforce that. And this was a, a liquor licence that had been issued in the 1980s, so it was left over from a, from a previous time. Um, so what we hope to do with this live music thing is bring all those different requirements, all those different authorities with regard to live music and put them all in one place, which is here in council, so that we can be the people that have the conversations with the traders, with the venues, with the residents and, and come up with a re resolution here instead of having a situation where now where a resident or a trader will satisfy council's requirements and then they'll satisfy the EPA's requirements, then they've got to go away and they've got to deal with a third or fourth um, lot of regulation that they need to deal with in order to, to, um, to comply with the, the live music requirements. And in the end, it just gets too hard for these businesses. It gets too hard for the residents and they all, they all give up and, and go away. So under this planning scheme amendment, Council would become the, the responsible authority for these um, issues. It, we still need to enforce the EPA requirements, so it's not going to to change that. We don't get to sit here and say, you know, we're going to increase what you know the EPA SEP N2, as we heard earlier, is a certain level, you know, 65 decibels measured a certain distance from the front door of the venue. We don't get to change all that, but we just get to be the people that, that decide what is compliant um, and, and what isn't. Um, and that we're hoping that will help our venues when they when they have issues um, deal with this, and we can we can be the arbiters of, of what's relevant and what's um, acceptable um, and what what impacts these are having on our neighbourhoods and what's reasonable. And you know, being a, a planning permit and things like that, it's still appealable, appealable to VCAT. So you're not taking away people's VCAT rights or any of that, but we're just hopefully simplifying the process here for live music and create an environment in which live music manuals will want to come to St Kilda. Obviously, they'll need to be compliant, but they'll come to St Kilda because they know the, the framework in which they operate will be nice and simple and um, that they only have to deal with the local council to resolve any issues or any compliance standards instead of having to go from from body to body, department to department, state to local, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we're hoping to achieve here. It all sounds rather um, complicated. There's a lot of other elements here, you know, live music incubation. Um, you know, we want St Kilda to be the home of live music. We would, you know, we'd love to have more live music and because it is a big driver of our local economy here in St Kilda and that's something we, we all recognise, but we, we wish to create a situation where that um, is much easier for both residents and our venues to, to operate under with, with, with dealing with one organisation such as us here in Council. So that's one element of what this policy, but there are plenty of other items here, but that's, that's the one I think that we as a Council can have the, have the biggest impact here on our on our, our neighbourhood by being um, able to resolve these these issues that go on for, you know, I know of some that have gone on for 10 or 12 years, noise complaints between residents and venues because they just don't get resolved and they roll on from from one organisation to the other, one statutory authority to the other. So I'll leave it there but urge my fellow councillors to support this policy. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Councillor Crawford, you do not want to speak. Does anybody else want to speak to this item? All right, show we're all getting a little more tired. We'll take it to the vote then. All those in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. All right, next we have 12.2, Palace Foreshore 2324 event proposal and then 2022 event review. Councillors, do we have any questions of the officers on this item? Oh, so many now. Okay, uh, Councillor Clark. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, my question is around the comments before raised um, by one of the speakers in relation to how does council officers suggest we validate um, how many 
uh, shows are actually put on according to what the agreement is and how many car parks uh, actually agreed to be allocated and are actually available uh, at any point in time through that this period, please. So through you, Mayor, um, there were officers on site regularly during the last activation and we never encountered um, any discrepancy with the number of car parks, that we were clear on the number of car parks that were allocated on show days and the number of car parks that were allocated on non-show days. Um, we would suggest to, to the traders that if they do notice any discrepancy in that, they contact us as soon as possible and we would get somebody on site right away. But we do not, um, you know, until this evening, we are not aware of that being an, a, a issue last year. Um, in terms of the number of performances, um, we will be working closely with the promoter over the upcoming months should um, councillors approve the proposal tonight to confirm the number of shows. Obviously, the number of days allocated needs to be commensurate with the shows, so we would expect um, the number of shows to be in line with what's been proposed. I know they are hoping to do more. Um, the purpose of this activation is to coordinate touring schedules um, from acts that are touring around the country. Um, so the more time they have, the more they can coordinate those people coming to Melbourne. Uh, certainly, should they not be able to deliver on the number of shows that they are proposing, then we would be expecting them to reduce the footprint accordingly. Yes, Councillor Clark. So just to follow up then, given that there has been some discrepancies raised tonight, um, would it not be appropriate to reach out to some of those traders that perhaps aren't supportive or perhaps have raised those concerns to at least agree at the beginning that these are the car parks um, that are to be left and find a way of just agreeing to that? And then I think going forward, it would be easier for both sides to validate potentially. I'm not talking about staking out <laughs> the car parks every day, but sort of give that understanding at the beginning and then it's easy to manage. And if it is a variance, it's easy for a trader to ring up and say, hey, that's changed or something along those lines. Through you, Mayor, the number of car parks allocated were what were confirmed in the council report that was endorsed last year. We would expect the number of car parks allocated to be what's in the council report this evening. Um, so the traders would have clear indication of the number of car parks. Yeah, I guess my point is, can we work together to agree visually what that looks like so that I guess that helps reduce any discrepancies in the future? Certainly. Potentially. Absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Martin, question? Um, I had three, but Councillor Clark has stolen two of them. So thank you for that, Councillor Clark, and thank you for the replies. My third question is, if this motion is passed tonight, is it possible to treat the days that have been allocated as maximum days and would council officers commit to working with the promoter to try and look at see if, if we can reduce the footprint that they've got by re perhaps re reducing the number of days for bump in, um, bump out, perhaps look at um, at periods where there aren't, if there's a three or four day hiatus between shows, would it be possible to increase additional parking and so on? Um, and if the promoter did agree, or if, if we were successfully able to work with the promoter to do that, this and this is assuming the motion was carried in the first place, this would then assist council in making decisions in future years about whether they wanted to go through the process again. So is that something that we would be looking at doing as council officers? Um, through you, Mayor, we can absolutely treat the number of days as the maximum number of days permitted. Um, we would be clear that the numbers in this report um, are the numbers required. In terms of freeing up spaces when there's a period of non-event days, um, we did find the promoter very amenable to trying to do this last year. Um, you know, we need to be honest that the size and the nature of the infrastructure um, makes this very challenging from a safety perspective, um, but they would do whatever they could. Um, depending on what acts are secured, depending on what dates are secured, we are confident they are very well aware of the issues around the parking impact to traders. Um, they've been aware of this the, the whole time and they would certainly do what was in their power to free up any parking spaces if that were at all possible. And I've got a second question which I've just thought of. I'm sorry about this. If during the if again, if the motion was passed, if in the first activation period in November it was obvious that... Um, what council wanted wasn't actually being fulfilled, would there be any way to terminate the arrangement so they wouldn't be able to come back for seconds? And you know, we'd be talking about major breaches. I'm not saying you know, we're down two car park spaces on one day, but if there were significant breaches of the agreement, would it be possible to terminate the agreement so that then we wouldn't go through the same thing again the following March? 
Um, through you, Mayor, if there were significant breaches um, to the agreement, then yes, we would be in a position to withdraw the subsequent agreement. Thank you. Further questions? So I'll go over here to Nyagui. Thank you, Councillor Nyagui. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my question was just about the possibility of utilising the um, infrastructure on non-show days for community groups and others, and whether we had any guarantees about that and whether we'd be able to sort of enforce that through the contract. Um, through you, Mayor, we have confirmation from the promoter that they would be very amenable to community groups or other um, members of the community utilising the infrastructure on non-show days. Great. Councillor Clark, do you have another question? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, in the report, it says that 73 times $10 Uber vouchers were used by trader patrons out of the 750 vouchers committed. Who committed to provide those vouchers and who, who is, is that being uh, provided again and who is able to use them? Um, through you, Mayor, so Publica Live Nation provided those vouchers last year to be shared amongst the foreshore traders for use by their staff and their patrons. Um, so the, how those vouchers were allocated was left to the traders to allocate, um, but quite a low portion of them were used. Um, we haven't had discussions at this stage as to whether they would be allocated again. Um, it happened because there wasn't sufficient capacity in the Seabarts car park, um, which had been the original agreement that car spaces would be purchased in the Seabarts car park. That wasn't forthcoming, hence the Uber vouchers were offered as an alternative. Um, so these are certainly discussions we could have again with the promoter. As I said, they remain very flexible um, in terms of mitigating trader concerns as much as they can. And then the traders would be able to allocate them to people who book at the restaurants or whatever Correct. business they It was they left have. to the traders to allocate them if they chose to use them for staff or if they chose to use them for patrons or in competitions. It was left to them to decide how they wish to allocate those vouchers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Um, there was some suggestions, and I'm, I know we have, um, I don't know what they're called, the flashing trailer lights, whether there is opportunity over that time, which I don't know if we did already, to indicate where various parking, given that, um, that parking towards the skate park never gets fully utilised and there is further down. So I know there's a little bit of a walk, but in the city you have to walk to venues. So I'm just wondering whether that's a possibility we could explore. Um, through you, Mayor, absolutely we could use our LED signs to indicate other parking opportunities. I think um, as officers we could also provide some promotional materials around parking opportunities to all of the impacting traders, um, both for distribution with bookings but also on their websites and socials channels. May I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. Yep. Um, in one of the conversations that wasn't mentioned here tonight, there was some, um, with the bus parking, apparently the system with the QR codes was not as easy or it wasn't taken up very much. Is there also a possibility that we could look into if there were ways to simplify that process as part of this? Um, through you, Mayor, absolutely. We're very happy to work with Luna Park around bus parking. We have received confirmation from our parking team that there is absolutely no issue with buses continuing to drop off and pick up patrons direct from outside Luna Park. Um, so access to the park itself will not be impacted by this activation. Um, last year, we arranged for parking in the marina car park and toilets were provided specifically for drivers and everything else. Um, Live Nation are very willing to do that again, um, you know, should Luna Park wish to explore that. Thank you. Any other questions tonight? No. All right, if not, I'm looking for a mover and a seconder. Councillor Bond to move. Anybody want to second the officer's recommendation? Councillor Baxter. All right, Councillor Bond, would you like to speak to it? Um, yes, I will. When the Palace Foreshore event happened um, last year, there was a flyer put out that was distributed to all of St Kilda. It said something like, you know, the St Kilda Triangle is not a live music venue. Ironically, the picture they used still had the Palace nightclub in it of when the St Kilda Triangle was a live music venue. Um, the St Kilda Triangle has always been a live music venue from 1913 to 1969 it was the home of the Palais de Dance, um, 1972 to 2007 it was the home of the Palace. So this, this site has a real connection with, with live music um, in this area. The flyer that was put out urged um, local residents to contact their local councillors um, and give their feedback on this particular site um, with a clear intention of saying we don't agree with, with these events taking place. 
I never received a single email or got a single phone call as a result of that flyer. So um, that is a fairly good indication of the thoughts of the local community on what they would like us as a council to do on this site. Um, we've heard from local traders that they support this, this venue um, and that it was good for their business when there were, were activations happening there. Um, and we've heard from a couple of traders located on the foreshore that have told us how important the car parking is to, their, to the operations of their venues. And from, from you know, hearing the conversations and from listening to officers, I'm fairly strongly of the opinion that if we could maximise the car pass use on this site, um, and we've heard mixed reports on whether or not that happened, that happened last time, but if, now that we're aware of that, if we could ensure that the car parking was used on this site, um, as, as the diagram in the, in the report intends it to be used, um, that would alleviate um, a number of the concerns of, of the traders in the local area. It won't, obviously won't alleviate all of their concerns. However, it will alleviate um, some of them. I've always found, and yes, I live in St Kilda and I've got a car park in my building, but I've never had an issue getting car parks in and around St Kilda. You know, I can always get one in the Belford Street car park, Peanut Farm, there's lots of parking, Upper Esplanade. Um, you know, there's a... There's a good car park in the sea bars that I've never actually seen fill up. Um, so there is, a, I think, in my view, there's enough parking in this area to, to allow this facility to, this project to come in, operate and leave again. Um, we, last year we did this at the end of November and the start of December and the feedback we received from, the, from a number of traders, some of whom have come along to speak to us tonight, was that that, that was their prime um, operating time that Christmas period, so we've we've moved it forward to October, November, in order to to cater for, or in order to to respond to that feedback we were given last time. So we, you know, we do listen, we do um, take on board your feedback, but we also accept that that activations like this are important for our local area. So um, I will be supporting this, and I'll urge my my fellow councillors to support it. And if there, you know, if there are problems, we can always. Um, address them down the track, but you know this, this the um, operators, especially live music operators, they need time in order to book acts. Um, if we were to delay this or make this decision later in the year, most of the acts they would probably like to book would already be booked elsewhere, and this just won't fit into their schedule. Which is why, why we're making this decision decision in March for an activation that happens in November. So, urge my fellow councillors to support this. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Councillor Baxter? No, you don't want to speak to it. Does anybody else want to speak to the item tonight? Councillor Pearl? Thanks, Madam Mayor. just want to put an amendment, if I may, and I'll, I'll read it as slowly as I can because I've just typed it up. So the amendment oh, adds 3.3, right. and happy to take edits on the critique if you wish. Uh, council officers... It might help if you just read it out and then we'll get the governance to catch up. So we can consider council what officers to work with the applicant and local businesses to ensure that all reasonable measures are taken to limit the impact on local businesses and the general community. Sorry, governance. I'm really putting you under the pump, but I think Councillor uh, Pearl can uh, clarify. That gives us an opportunity to consider what you're doing. Can you look up and see if that's correct, Councillor Pearl? Oh, that sinks. Wow, that was quick. I know. That's talent over there. Yeah, go for it. Um, Councillor Pearl, I, I assume that you want to limit negative impact. Uh, yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Is that something that you're happy to make? <laughs> yeah, happy, happy to put that in there. If we put the word negative in there. Limit the negative impact. To... Yep, to limit any neg negative, well... That's not... No, that's, that's not going to work. Uh, no, negative, just put, put the word negative in there. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Oh, yeah, there, sorry. So it's workshopping here. Next and question, is there a second, I think, because we're wasting our time. That's right. Oh, thanks. Okay, so we have an amendment. By, let me just count, catch up on my paperwork here. An amendment by Councillor Pearl, seconded by Councillor Martin. That works because neither of you moved or second the first movement. Okay. So, Councillor Pearl, would you like to speak to this? 
Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So, councillors, if I'm reading my tea leaves right, it looks like this may... I haven't heard everyone speak, but I think this may get up. This doesn't add, uh, freely admit, doesn't add a huge a lot of assurance to uh, the local businesses and people who are going to be negatively impacted by this permit if it gets approved here this evening. Um, but what it does do, at least it gives a minimum benchmark for some direction to the officers that we expect them to work with the permit holder and the affected businesses to drive an outcome. So it was disappointing tonight that we didn't hear from the, the permit applicant so we could make an ass a clear assessment about whether or not we think that they are rigid, so to speak, in terms of their willingness to be able to work with uh, local businesses that are deeply impacted by this permit, potentially, um, and work with the community. We were told uh, indirectly that that is the case. Um, this puts the officers uh, potentially in a slightly difficult position in some respects, and I'm not asking them to, um, you know, if it gets in any way, shape or form outside the remit of what is reasonable, um, that's why the word reasonable is in there to remove themselves. But council has a role to play based on uh, the fact that it's our site, it's our permit, and we're having an impact on a broader community to ensure that we do everything we possibly can so the permit holder um, is held to account in some respects in making sure that the, any negative impact from the permit is min minimalised uh, and it provides uh, councillors assurances here that that will actually take place. So councillors, it's a small amendment. I'll take that um, on board. Uh, but I think it's a, a small piece uh, that is important if this motion gets up here this evening. So I'd ask you to support it. Thank you. Councillor Martin speaking to the amendment. And so thank you. Thank you to our officers for answering the queries that I raised earlier. But as Councillor Pearl pointed out, they were, they were informal conversations. This, I think, formalises some of the questions that I asked and the response that I was very comfortable with as well. But I think it's good that we have this on the record. And given the concerns that have been raised, we're being very clear that we want to make sure that all of our local um, live music people and others uh, come out of this in, in, in as best way as possible. So we're not seen as actively working to disadvantage anyone. We're doing our best to make sure that we're minimising the impact on any traders who might be adversely affected. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak to the amendment? If not, we'll put that to the vote. Only on Just to clarify, Mayor, we're voting on the amendment only, only and yes. then we'll vote on the whole yes. policy. Yeah. So right now we're voting on the amendment. If it passes, it becomes part of the substantive. If it fails, we go back to the original... Um, recommendation. All right. All those in favour of the amendment? That's carried unanimous. Thank you. So now the entire thing becomes what we're voting on. Thank you. Now I've had it, the original part, which includes this, moved by Councillor Bond, seconded by Councillor Baxter. Bond has spoken to it. So everybody else can, and Baxter decided not to speak to it. Everybody else has the opportunity to speak to this item now. Councillor Sirikoff? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, while, while I really um, welcome and embrace, um, you know, these live live uh, concerts, it's it's great to see all these um, musicians performing and great adding the vibrancy and um, attracting people from all over Melbourne to come and enjoy these type of events. But at the same time, um, I'm a little bit concerned about. Uh, the arrangements in this, um, what's being put forward to us in the papers. Um, we're looking at a, um, a prime car park which serves uh, the majority of St Kilda to go to so many venues, whether it's on the foreshore, Fitzroy Street or Ackland Street, um, and any other events that might be occurring. So to be using the, this St Kilda Triangle car park for the Live Nation, not just for five days or six days. We're talking of 82 days, over 120 days um, during the prime season, during the summer months when everybody gets out and wants to do things, whether it's to go to the beach uh, or, or go to, as I said before, to the restaurants and cafes. Um, I just find that it's... Go or go to a concert. And that concert, I think, should um, be located elsewhere, um, notably Katani Gardens, where then that car park can serve all those different activities and businesses. 
um, to be putting it right in the middle of St Kilda where a car park is needed for people to come and visit this uh, St Kilda precinct, I just find it the, the, not appropriate, mainly because you've, over those 80, over those um, 82 days, basically you've got one show every 3.6 days. So it basically lies bare um, for nobody else to access any car parking for any other activities in the area to other restaurants. So I think this uh, should be a case where Live Nation takes note that when they're doing... Oh, it's great to be doing 22 events, that's wonderful. But to have a tighter schedule to reduce the impact, the negative impact, as pointed out in the amendment just made, to um, also take notice of what's happening to the rest, rest of the uh, St Kilda precinct. Um, so we need, Luna Park, we need all venues, Luna Park, Fitzroy Street, Ackland Street, Foreshore Traders, to all be thriving over a a summer period over a high peak period where um, providing park, car parking central to all of these activities. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Nyagui. Thank you, Mayor. Um, oh, it's a tricky one, this, and it's tricky because we're obviously trying to balance the interests of many different traders, many different residents, and all the people who love to come and visit St Kilda. So we have to answer difficult questions and not necessarily satisfy everyone. Um, I mean, I kind of... Whenever I look at the triangle side, I always sort of see it as slightly an open wound in the middle of St Kilda. It's pretty ugly. We need those car parking spaces. No, no one disputes that. But to say that that's the best way it can be and that's the best utilisation of that piece of land is probably not something that anyone in this room would agree with. Um, so when we have opportunities like this to activate the site over summer to bring live music um, into the heart of our municipality, into the heart of St Kilda, I think we should try as best we can to jump on that. Um, I think the amendment put forward by Councillor Pearl provides um, officers with a pretty clear directive to work with Live Nation to minimise the impacts. I think there's lots of opportunity to do that. We can certainly look at things like you know, better signage around where there's alternative parking, to better monitor the use of those additional parking spaces on non-show days. And I think there's also opportunities through our discussions with Live Nations to utilise that infrastructure on non-show days as well for community groups and the like. Um, but ultimately, I think this is a good proposal. I think it will benefit St Kilda. And I think, um, you know, if there's continuing issues, we need to keep working with traders, especially those on the foreshore or the most impacted, to minimise that. But ultimately, I think we've got a really great summer of events ahead of us, and I look forward to this proposal being supported by my fellow councillors. Thank you. Any else want to speak to the item? Councillor Crawford. I agree, it's a tough one. Um, in trying to balance everything up, I think um, probably like Councillor Nyagui makes uh, the point that not everyone will be happy. I went to the Avalon Air Show a couple of weeks ago and it was a debacle. And the reason it was a debacle because I got on a bus that should have taken 10 minutes from the train station but they allowed, they had maximum number of people attending, um, but there were lots of cars and it was gridlocked. Now we want people to come to St Kilda, but not everyone can drive, that's a fact. It's a fact every day of the week when it's busy. We have events, we actually need people so that people can get here. The ones that need to drive can and the others catch public transport or, or shared you know, Ubers or cabs. Like the reality is we, not everyone can drive to St Kilda. That's a full, we just, we're never going to have enough park parking for the number of people that we'd actually like to attract here to go to all of our businesses. That is the reality. It's like behaviour change. It's like when we complain about traffic but then we don't put in bike lanes to allow people another way to get around. So I'm really heartened by um, Councillor Pearl's addition. We actually need to try and work with not just traders, but with the people that are coming to St Kilda, give them the options on parking, let them know about the public transport, share a car instead of all driving separately. Often when they're going to not so much Luna Park but other venues, they might be having a drink, so it possibly is a safer way to, to, to get there by catching a cab. Um, it's not ideal, but we actually will never be able to provide enough car parks for everybody who would want to drive. And that's true in the city, it's true everywhere at any venue. 
um, or any place that you would go to. Um, so it's actually about changing the thinking. I, I get, and we need to maximise the spaces on the days that there aren't concerts on to allow for those people who do need to drive and maximise the number of the car spaces, identify the skate park and identify um, under the sea baths. But we actually also have to face the reality that not everyone can drive and park in St Kilda. And, you know, that is just a reality. So I understand and I sympathise with the traders. I'm looking forward to officers working to make the most of it. Just technically, and I wasn't aware of this, that we did move it um, from November... Um, December into November. So technically it's not in summer. It's only in March and it's only in November. So it's not over the peak summer months. So we have tried to make some accommodations. I understand the concern, but in balancing it, I think this is the recommendation of the officers is the right one to support. Thank you. Another councillor want to speak to this? Councillor Clark. Thanks, Mayor. Um, we have some survey data um, from, from people uh, who were asked about the closure of the car park that was shared with us this afternoon. Um, and if I'm interpreting it correctly, that um, if the car park was closed, 19% of visitors to Luna Park would find another place to visit. If the park was closed, visitors to specified restaurants, 38% would find another place to visit. Um, and a similar percentage around the Palais. So I think this car park does make um, a huge difference to many venues. Um, also noting that the Ackland Street traders and the Fitzroy Street traders um, talk about the positives. So it, it is a balance. Um, the length of time uh, is what concerns me around this proposal. Um, I'm pleased to see that this time the first slot in November finishes before Christmas, but the March um, tranche, if you like, uh, goes for 44 days, um, and during that time you have 32 days with an empty car park, just an empty car park, no shows. I get that you have to set it up that way, but there's nothing going on and no one else is able to utilise uh, the car park, or well, the, the ones that are closed off for the shows. So uh, in that time in March, particularly in April. You've got Easter, school holidays, a long weekend. I think that's a big impact on what I would call the broader St Kilda because it's not just... Um, it's everyone, families coming that utilise this car park. And unfortunately, um, it might be an ugly sore. <laughs> I agree, but it's an ugly sore that's a car park that's certainly well utilised. Uh, and I feel that... In trying to find the balance across all of the competing interests, which is what you know, councils have talked about, uh, and live music is important, and we do have we do have a lot of that. I would prefer to see this utilised, the times being shortened, and I know that might not make it an optimal music event, but that to me, uh, from my point of view, would be a better balance um, across uh, the this area of our municipality. Um, I went to Donovan's last weekend and I drove and I could catch many other forms of getting there, but I chose to drive myself. So, uh, you know, I can only imagine the options that people have coming a lot further than uh, the short distance that I had to get there. So um, it is a difficult decision, but on balance, um, I'm not supportive of the policy, as I said, because it just is too long uh, and I don't think it balances up all the competing interests. That said, um, I'm not unsupportive of having the festival, the music event there. We have had it in different sh shapes and formats, um, but I just feel it doesn't quite achieve the right balance from my perspective. But I appreciate that officers are continually trying to find events and bring those things to our community as well, so thank you. Thank you. Any other councillors? Councillor Pearl? Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is a, uh, a difficult one. It's not a tricky one, it's a difficult one because on one side it does exactly what we want it to do. We've been invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into that site over the past um, six, six years in activation to get this exact outcome. So we get people that uh, don't require council support to activate the site because in the long term the vision of that needs to be set, but I think the majority of people will want that site developed at some point in the future, and the future of that site hopefully has some form of bent 
um, not, not foreshadowing anything here, but obviously it has some, some bent towards live music attached to it, which would be a wonderful outcome. So the good news is it's being activated. The difficulty, and it, the difficulty is when you say to someone, thank you for investing in our community and, and putting live music where it is, uh, that's, that's good, uh, but it's also fair and reasonable to say to the people that have invested perhaps tens of millions of dollars on the foreshore uh, for permanent inst establishments that probably bring as many, if not more people, in the case of Lunar Park, I would suggest a lot more people, um, to the city as an activation and also part of the DNA of the city um, that you're going to lose at the advantage of someone using public open space, it becomes a bit more complex. I think this will get up this evening and on balance I'm going to disappoint many people by supporting it because I think um, on balance I'm satisfied that the net benefit to the community is warrants the um, imposition that's going to be placed upon the community and some of the traders, uh, but my hands are sweaty when I say that on the basis that I think there's a role to be played by the permit holder, which I don't understand why they wouldn't come here this evening. So if you'd asked me before I walked into the door, I'd be... Um, they can dial in from New Zealand. Last time I checked, in, New Zealand had internet, but... Um, <laughs> It would have been good to hear from them to understand what they were saying and where they were at and where their mindset was at. Uh, but this gives some assurance at least that council officers will undertake that process to see if we can get some um, mitigated bargains in terms of uh, changing schedules and opening up car parks to ensure that uh, particularly the, the, the three or four businesses, if you include the sea bars, probably a lesser extent there, um, have some avenue to be able to uh, voice their complaints and potentially get a better outcome uh, for their businesses. But net, net, I think it's a positive for the um, city. I think it's a positive for that site, and I'll vote for it on that basis. But thank you, councillors, for incorporating 3.3 uh, .3 into the motion. Thank you, Councillor Pearl. Councillor Martin. I'll be brief. Thank you very much, Councillor Pearl, for your amendment. You heard my questions of officers earlier, so you know that I had some significant concerns about the way the original motion was worded. I'm a little bit more comfortable now, particularly as we've been assured that if there was any, any sort of major brief, there would be significant action taken. I'm not suggesting that will be necessary, but I'm glad that that's there. That gives me a little bit more confidence that uh, we're going to be looking after all of our traders. Great to have the activation. Lots of people will be pleased, but we need to look after everybody in our city. So I'll be supporting it, but with the same reservations that Councillor Pearl has brought up. All right. Anybody else want to speak to this one? No? All right, I will. Uh, some have already mentioned this is com competing priorities. We want to bring live music and people to our area, but we also want to balance that support of existing buildings and make sure that they're still viable. So it is a challenging one. I see more and more holiday parties from organizations, families, friends, moving into November. So I understand that places like Luna Park Express tonight, that that is a busy time as well. So whilst people respect that December was a move off date, it's also having other impacts I don't think have been fully considered. Also, Luna Park is uh, having a really successful event around Halloween. My understanding it's five days, including the 31st of October. And that is, to some people's dislike, a really growing you know, celebration. Things Kids, families really enjoy it. And that's something that there aren't many events on, and it's cool that something in our city is embracing it, and it's a growth market, essentially. So I think that if that's a date that, even though it's in the bracket of days recognized here as bump in, bump out, if it didn't have to happen, that would be a benefit. So shaving it off the October side, because that's a, a good event. The... I'm really delighted to hear that community use of the facility would be, or the, the setup would be on offer. Uh, small note, my school, my kids' school, used the Palais for a concert in 
late November 2019. Still a highlight of the school. If we got every local school doing their end of year concert in November in this space, I think you're going to have a lot of um, enthusiasm from the locals in, that will bring people to the area to spend on those off days. It's a cool idea and it wouldn't just be the school. So the more that can be um, communicated and utilized, the better. Now, I would like some reassurance. I guess my vote tonight is based on the report as submitted, being including the site plan that is part of the attachment. Now, maybe it's a clarifying question. Is that site plan based on the report, or that's a site plan that's also based on the proposal this year? Uh, through you, Mayor, yes, that is the site plan based on the proposal for this year. Okay. Um, I, know, I note that we have in the confidential site section of the meeting tonight that we will be speaking about the Palais Four Court, uh, Palais Theatre and Luna Park Precinct revitalization. That is a separate matter, but it involves possibly areas in here. And part of the report tonight brought up that when that was an active project last year, that things were re rejigged around Lower Esplanade. So should that project reemerge, and I don't know where the site plan for that one is, if this site plan is not achieved, what are... Um, I'd like to say that my vote tonight would be based on this site plan. Should it change and not be able to be there and that now the proposal goes to remove more car parks, my support would no longer stand. That is kind of, so that's, is this a question, clarifying question. So that is how it's read. The, the site plan as of the report is how it will be. Yeah, so through you, Mayor, um, should councillors endorse the report tonight? It includes the number of parks specified within this report. So if the number of parks specified in this report were no longer able to be delivered based on other works, we would come back to council to discuss that. But based on last year's experience, um, all areas of council worked together um, when the issue did eventuate and make, made sure that the same number of parks were delivered. Thank you for getting my words out better than I did. I don't, I'm not sure, but um, oh, um, let me keep going. Now, again, so suggestions around moving dates, if you can shave off that part of October, but also in April around school holidays, that taking up the entire amount of school holidays, if it does, seems excessive and really pulling that back. Easter's not so much, I mean, it also is an event that Luna Park does, but some school holidays would really be a gesture to understand that the, the impact that this proposal does have on our community. All right, can you read my own notes? I think that's enough. Uh, Councillor Sirikoff, you have a question? I don't think... Unless you have a point of order, I don't think I actually am allowed to let you speak. But I think that my point may be hopefully of support to what you're thinking there. All right, so I've spoken. I think that is nearly everybody who has wanted to speak. So we're going to put that to the vote. The vote is the... What? Oh, sorry. Right of reply, Councillor Bond. Do you have anything else you want to add? No? All right. Okay, let's put it to the vote. All those in favour? One, two, three, four... I can't see all the way. Councillor, four, five, six. All right, those against? All right, that's three. Thank you. That's carried. All right. Thank you. Respectful debate. I appreciate that. We're going to move on to item... What are we on? Yep, 12.3 Business Parklet Guidelines 2023. Okay, councillors, do we have any questions of the officers on this report? Councillor Martin? Um, I have a question which is probably more a clarifying question for people who have been contacting me. In the document there are listed the number of parklets that are available in various different localities and I see for example in Armstrong Street, Middle Park, there's, it says there are to be 14 parklets. Now does this mean that 14 parklets must be placed in Armstrong Street? Does it mean that um, there are up to 14 parklets but people would need to show courses to why they could be there? 
And if that number of parklets was reduced to a lower number, because I, there is a possibility that there may be some alternative recommend, alternative recs out there, would, would again, that specify that, let's say the number was eight rather than 14, would that specify there had to be eight parklets or would it simply be that there was the potential for eight parklets and potential users would have to justify um, any application before they got them? Uh, through you, Mayor, so the number of um, the numbers you're referring to are the number of parking bays, the maximum number of parking bays that can be allocated in any um, precinct. Those numbers were set in 2001, so the 14 for Armstrong Street, for example, has been there since 2001. It is not um, a new addition this evening. Um, in the case of Armstrong Street, there is only currently one business um, who has applied to have a parklet, um, so it is unlikely that the 14 parking bays would be allocated. However, um, councillors can, of course, um, make any amendments to those numbers that they wish to. Certainly in the case of um, Ripponlea and Ormond Road, based on experience over the last few years, we have lessened the numbers uh, based on those activity centres. Thank you. Any other questions? No. All right. Do I have to note that Councillor Pax has left the room? Councillor Clark, you have a question? Sorry. Um, and so the, the experience that you talked to, Lauren, around um, Ormond Road and Ripponlea, I've been heavily involved with. Um, if, if the policy remains at 14 tonight, if it did, how would you propose would be the right process for um, um, Ormond um, on Strong Street, sorry, and Middle Park to sort of evaluate or work with council if they did feel that subsequently um, it wasn't working. Um, so through you, Mayor, um, the parklet permits are re renewed annually, so there is the opportunity each year to reduce parklets if required. So um, if too many are permitted, then we have the opportunity to work with council to decide um, how many would actually be appropriate in which cases um, traders may be asked to reduce. Um, if you'll remember in Ormond Road, we sort of took quite an equitable approach and asked a wide number of traders to give up one parking bay each. Um, but it's unlikely that that will become an issue in Armstrong Street at this stage, as we only still remain with one business interested in undertaking a parklet. Okay, any other questions? If not, let's go with a mover, Bond, and a seconder. Sorry, I missed hand. Sarah, are you moving? I just want to uh, foreshadow that I'd like to make an amendment. Okay, so you're not moving this one. So, Councillor Martin, was that seconding? Okay, so I've got Councillor Bond to move, Councillor Martin to second, and there's a foreshadowing. Councillor Bond, would you like to speak to this? Uh, could we get the, re the alternate motion up on the... Oh, sorry, hold on. You're moving an alt motion? Yeah, the one I provided earlier to officers. Did you want to second that, Councillor Martin? Do you want to see it first? Okay. All right. Councillor Bond, can you confirm that's correct? Uh, yes, that's the amendment I circulated to councillors and officers earlier. I just ask you a question. No? All right. I guess you don't have to read it out. But I'm going to ask you to read it out just because um, people might be listening and not seeing it and it's not in the report. Oh, people at home who may not be able to see it. Um, the amendment alternate recommendation is that Council 3.1 endorse the Business Parklet Guidelines 2023. 3.2 notes that the revised guidelines will be used to assess all business parklet applications and renewals from April 2023 onwards. 3.3, amend the guidelines so that businesses will only be asked to prove demand exists for over four parking bays if there is demand from other businesses to utilise these spaces. So, 
Uh, we, so right now we have Council Bonds moved this, Council Martin seconded it. Did you have a clarifying question? Yeah, I, I don't really understand how this is going to work and demand's going to be proved. Like, I don't, I don't understand how a process would work around that. Perhaps I'm not... N neither do I, which is why I'm not so keen on having that as a measure in our parklet guidelines. However, okay. it's in there so at present. Maybe, uh, Councillor Clark, would you like to direct your question to officers to see if they could uh, clarify a bit, or Councillor Bond? There's an idea. Can you clarify uh, <laughs> Andrew Bond's amendment? Well, no, it, probably around how would you prove use? <laughs> Uh, through you, Mayor, based on um, councillor feedback, we added a section in the guidelines saying that any business who wished to utilise more than four parking bays would have to prove that demand for more than four parking bays exist. Um, it is on the onus of the trader to provide usage data at the moment as to how many people are utilising the parklet each day. So we would be requesting that they provide that usage data over a period of time, Monday to Friday, you know, nine, nine till nine or, or whatever it is. Um, we would make an assessment based on that data. You know, we would also likely, you know, given that there are very few um, of these parklets, I think we have four or five where there's over four parking bays, you know, officers would also routinely make visits and sort of make an assessment as well and a recommendation to council. Um, I'm going to ask a, it's on the clarifying question because I didn't know this was coming. Uh, how many car, how many parklets do we have at the moment that are over four? Uh, through you, Mayor, um, it's it's five or six. I, I'd have to confirm the exact, but it's That's five fine. or six. Thank you. Okay, so you have this alt motion up and what? amended motion. Sorry, amended motion. Now we're going to speak to it, unless there's a clarifying question. Sorry. That's all right. That's fine. We didn't know this was coming necessarily. Uh, so if there was an example of a... Um, existing business that had uh, more than four in an area that's not part of a high street strip of shops, would they need, how would, there would never be, is that the theory? There would never be a demand from any other business because they're in an isolated area of their own. So therefore, theirs would always be okay to remain over four. Um, through you, Mayor, utilising that amendment, then yes. All right. Unless there's any more clarifying questions. Sorry, Councillor Sierkoff there. Um, so does that mean that if there was a requirement to reduce the number of bays in a parklet because there was greater demand for car spaces, um, then that wouldn't hold? So through you, Mayor, um, the maximum number of parking bays that can be allocated is what we would refer to. So these guidelines don't necessarily allow for us to remove um, parking bays due to, to a perception for parking demand um, because the guidelines already clarify how many bays can be allocated per precinct. I think it could be clarified by saying remove demand for parklets, isn't it? Did you want to change the wording there? Happy to include those. Just to clarify that we are referring to our parklet guidelines here, in case that was unclear for anyone. All right, if you're okay with that, Councillor Martin, are you still okay to second that? Yep, okay. All right, do you have a clarifying question as well? All right, go for it. Uh, through you, Matt. Um, my question was just, we were just talking about the number of uh, parklets that are utilising more than four spaces. Did you have data on the number of parklets that are using just one space and two space? Um, through you, Mayor, I can provide that on notice. I don't um, know that off the top of my head. Just roughly, though, would there be... Oh, sorry. Through you, Mayor, there's around 66 parklets altogether in, in um, the municipality, so taking away that five or six that have over four, you know, probably 50 to 60. So going back to Governance question, did you want to change wording there, and what is yeah, it? I, I thought we were just going to put in the words, 
Um, for 3.3, amend the guidelines so that businesses will only be asked to prove demand exists for over four parking bays if there is demand for parklets from other businesses to utilise these spaces. Yeah, well, okay, fair enough. That does actually change a lot. Uh, thank you, Councillor Martin. Again, can you make sure that that says? Okay. All right, any last minute clarifying questions because we've moved on from questions. No, Councillor Baum, would you like to speak to it? The City of Port Phillip parklet guidelines. I've been on this council for a, a long time. Some would say too long. <laughs> and as a councillor, you see a lot of things that this council does that makes you shake your head and just wonder why. Sometimes to yourself, sometimes out loud. Much of what council does is criticised and sometimes that criticism is justified. But every now and then, Port Phillip Council gets it right. When COVID hit in 2020, this council proactively went out and opened our streets and our parks and our car parking spaces to our struggling businesses, and we got it right. We made a difference not just to the businesses and to our residents, but also to the public realm of our city. A visible difference that endures to this day and a difference in both mindset of many of our residents and in some of our public infrastructure that I, that I hope much of which will become permanent in Port Phillip. A few weekends ago, I had the pleasure of sitting in one of these COVID parklets, a parklet in Blessington Street, St Kilda. I listened to some music as part of the St Kilda Blues Festival. I had a drink, as I occasionally do on a warm Friday evening. However, this night was different as I was joined by approximately 300 others in doing so. Mostly locals, I would say mostly over 40 and overwhelmingly over 50. Many singing and dancing and drinking in the Blessington Street parklet. The weather was warm, the night was perfect, the businesses were run off their feet serving these customers and the liquor licence numbers were probably exceeded many times over. Such was the success of this parklet. But what a great night it was. At one stage I sat on my own with a wine and I took it all in for a moment. I watched people walk around the corner from Barclay Street or Midford Street, probably on their way home or way out, and observed the look on their faces as they came across this vibrant scene. The looks were mostly surprise, which then turned into joy, which then turned into a selfie as this delightful and most unexpected gathering in Blessington Street they had just randomly wandered across it wasn't real until it had been posted on Instagram or Facebook. So I texted someone a message that went along the lines of, Imagine you had just arrived in Barcelona or Madrid or Lisbon or Porto. You had just left your hotel to do some exploring for the evening. And a block later, you came across this scene of some 300 people drinking and dancing and listening to live music on a warm European evening. You would forever remember what a great city that was for it gave you that personal experience and that lifetime memory. You'd get home from that holiday and tell your friends about how they do outdoor drinking, dining and music so much better in Europe. And that all your friends must include a visit to, insert city here, on their next European holiday. But this wasn't Europe. This was St Kilda. This was Blessington Street on a random Friday evening in March. To see this place, Blessington Street, that started out as an idea during COVID, which then morphed into a small activation precinct with an even smaller budget, finally work and become such a great space for locals to enjoy in such numbers is genuinely one of my proudest moments on this council. I listened hard that night to all the people talking and singing and having a great time. But amongst the noise, the conversation and the high notes on that evening, there was one thing I didn't hear. I listened hard, I really did, waiting for that sentence, but it never came. Not one person was heard to say, I wish I had those car parks back. There will always be someone against pretty much anything we seek to undertake here at Council. The Blessington Street parklet was no different. People complained about the loss of car parks, 
and the colours were terrible and the circles were too round. There were some that were never going to visit these shops again because they could no longer park their car right out the front of those businesses. Well, no one is saying that now. What I've heard since is, why can't we do this in Blessington Street every Friday night, or once a month at least? All I will say is we're working on it. And the businesses in Blessington Street, the people for whom this was initially done way back in 2020, now that they have seen all the possibilities wouldn't have it any other way. Aside from Blessington Street, there are many other great spaces in Port Phillip that have come out of the COVID-inspired parklets, such as the Northport Hotel, the Railway Club Hotel, the Rising Sun Hotel in South Melbourne, and even Frankie's Cafe in St Kilda West. Itchy Knee in St Kilda are keen to upgrade their, upgrade their parklet, and having recently seen the proposed design, they will set off what I hope becomes a bit of a Port Phillip outdoor parklet version of the space race, as they take parklet, parklet dining functionality to the next level on the upper esplanade. Which brings me to the middle park. Despite what some claim the parklet at the hotel is used. Last night at 7.30, there were 23 people in the parklet. Last Thursday at 6.30, there were 37 people in the parklet. I don't expect the parklet at the Middle, hotel, Middle Park Hotel to be full of people drinking and dancing in the streets most night in order to justify its existence. But this parklet does bring people to Armstrong Street and it keeps them there long after most of the shops have closed, which is a good outcome for the street, even if some do not realise this yet. For this reason, I support it and I'm prepared to ensure the Middle Park Parklet stays if the Middle Park Hotel wants to retain it. And let's not forget the many officers from Council who have worked on this parklet policy from the start and who have worked with our traders initially on the setup and guidelines during COVID and who rolled out the parklet permits with just weeks and sometimes with just a few days notice so that businesses could get up trading without hesitation post lockdowns and who continue to work with traders and residents to this day on these parklets and on this policy. Our officers have been the conduit between residents and traders as teething issues were ironed out and mediated and as the parklets grew and disappeared. I say to you all, well done, and thank you all, because you have gotten this right. Thank you. <laughs> all right, Councillor Martin. One of the best things that we've done in Port Phillip for a very, very long time. Now, I have to admit, I am a user of the parklets, and it's less than a week since I had my last pint in a parklet, so I'm... Is that a conflict of interest? Um, but I, I think they've managed to activate some areas in our wonderful city which perhaps weren't quite as lively as they were previously. And I'd be very disappointed if we did anything to reduce the ease in which people are able to apply for parklets and then use them to activate their street. Having said that, I'm sure that our officers will use their discretion and they certainly wouldn't be accepting applications for parklets from people who weren't using them. And I know that we have review processes, so if a parklet is being underused, we're able to remove it. Um, speaking specifically to Councillor Bond's amendment, very keen to activate, but I'm, I can also see a situation where if two or three different businesses all wish to activate the same space, we could have competition, and therefore it's necessary in our policy to have some sort of handbrake on the situation so officers can evaluate what are the appropriate numbers of, of, of uh, parking spaces being used within the maximum cap set in the policy for that particular locality so that um, we can ensure that there's an equitable distribution. So, A, I think Councillor Bond's amendment removes a little bit of red tape but still acts as a handbrake to prevent um, competing interests being disadvantaged. But secondly, the policy itself, as I say, one of the one of the best things that we've done in Port Phillip in my lifetime. Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Mayor. Councillor Bond, you paint quite a picture. Um, I, was, I was very pleased with that. But uh, I think this um, the business parklet story uh, in Port Phillip is actually really a story about how uh, Council was able to really quickly respond to... Um, how we, how we utilise public space. 
And what I found so fascinating about the the, the vignette that um, uh, Councillor Bond so so eloquently described was that we're often told that um, you know reallocating public space from um, being used solely for storing vehicles to instead being activated uh, and used by people is some sort of utopian pipe dream. And um, you can't just remove cars and then all the people will get together and sing Kumbaya. I'm literally hearing a description of a time that everyone came together and sang Kumbaya when he did that. Obviously, it's not going to happen in every single circumstance. Obviously, there are times uh, uh, that are uh, there are times and places that are going to be much more suitable um, for that type of activation than others. But I think what we've actually learned through this is that um, the arguments uh, against repurposing uh, parking space and road space for the activation by people um, have have largely uh, not you know the, the arguments they made have not really come true. Generally, what we've done is we've removed a significant amount of parking from our uh, from our high streets and put, and given them over for people to hang out in, and it hasn't killed businesses. In fact, they're thriving. Um, so I think what I'm what I'm hoping uh, to see from this is is that we can continue this conversation about the highest and best use of public space. Um, there are a lot of very you know, long-standing arguments that need to be thoroughly and rigorously interrogated as to whether they still hold true about how people actually utilise uh, open space. Um, there is an intrinsic bias, I think, towards valuing parking spots and spots for storing vehicles over, say, green open space um, uh, that uh, I would like to see um, reversed. But I think this here is actually, as Councillor Bond says, an example of where we actually took a bit of a punt and nailed it. Not to say that there were absolutely no flaws or that we never did anything wrong throughout this entire process. I want to make sure that this was iterative and there was two-way communication the entire way with um, quite a lot of elements of the community and, and business. But I just uh, I feel pretty proud of, of, of where we've ended up uh, here and uh, the way that we can actually continue on as, as a place where we're known for our fresco dining and people uh, enjoying themselves safely um, out in public space is um, something I want us to have a reputation for. So I'm um, all for supporting this. Thank you. Councillor Sirikoff? Uh, can I move an amendment, please, Mayor? Yes, you can. Um, sorry? No, this is an amendment. This is an alt motion, so this is the live one. What is your amendment? Um, the officers have got my amendment. If they could show it, please. Sorry, just give them a moment to catch up. Thanks. All right. Uh, yep, yeah, thank you. Would you read out your amendment, please? Just uh, 3.4. Amend the permitted number of parking bays that can be allocated for parklets in the arms... Armstrong Street Activity Centre from 14 to 8. Thank you. Is there someone going to second that? All right, Councillor Clark. Let me just catch up on my paperwork. Hold on. So, um, I need more paper here. So, an, an amendment moved by Councillor Sirikoff and uh, seconded by Councillor Clark. All right, Councillor Sirikoff, you can speak to this, and everybody can speak to this item because it's its own amendment. Yeah, and we'll, then we'll vote on that, and then we'll go back to see where it's gone. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree with that parklets have worked out to be a great thing during COVID. It enabled people to get out on the street to eat, drink, and those thousands and thousands of coffees which they picked up, and then went to a parklet to drink those coffees. Um, so it has been a great way to... Um, not get cabin fever, uh, even though we're in the five kilometre ring of steel during the COVID period, it did serve a purpose, these parklets. But here we are now out, out of COVID and uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of places that want to get back to normal, to, a, to um, the activities in their streets that were before. Parklets do still serve a purpose and one size does not fit all. So while the parklets might work in some uh, villages, or high streets, it's not necessarily the same for all. So um, as a, my amendment really is due to the very fact that 
Over the past few weeks, I have received quite a number of emails from residents opposing 14 car spaces being allocated to parklets in the Armstrong Street village. Most of these um, emails oppose parklets altogether. Because of this reaction to no parklets in Armstrong Street, I took it upon myself to canvas the views of the business in that street and what they thought of parklets and if they were a benefit or not a benefit to their economy. Um, that survey that I took yesterday, which took about three hours, um, talking to each of the uh, businesses that, that were available to speak to, if they, if the, uh, if the store was not vacant, that is empty, nobody running that business, um, or running running a business in a shop, I sent that uh, to all councillors as a summary of that informal survey. The common message that I found from the residents' emails and from the businesses alike was that, one, car spaces are a vital part of attracting customers to Armstrong Street Village and to keep the economy going in that street. Um, two, do not further reduce the number of available car spaces available so that economy can continue. The street has wide footpaths and easily accommodates footpath tra trading instead of the existence of parklets. We are now out of COVID and want to revitalise the village by, by attracting new businesses that do have the car spaces to have customers to come to that street and shop there. Although this informal survey, in this, also this is the informal survey, the majority of businesses either wanted to reduce parklet bays or do not want parklets and would prefer car spaces for customers. This is a very diverse uh, shopping centre, as we would have all seen. It's got GP, a chemist, two food stores, um, hairdressers, jeweller, post office, a dance school, accommodating many uh, uh, young budding dancers, um, and their parents are uh, driving there and dropping them off. We've got a fitness centre, newspaper shop, shoe repair shop, pet shop, three cafes and four restaurants, even a nail shop. And um, along with that, there's the one pub. The, one, the, uh, the majority of, those bi of these businesses are non-hospitality businesses and exist and re rely on daytime trading and need car spaces for customers, also from outside of Middle, Middle Park to get there. Just as parklets were, as well we had parklets where that were also reduced in um, Ormond Road from 10 to 8, 10 to 8 parking bays and also reduced in Ripponlea from 8 to 6. This was to recognise the concerns of the businesses and how they would continue to function and grow. And the same applies to the Middle Park Shopping Centre for the type of customer base that they have. Uh, later this, late this afternoon, the IGA business owner sent through a petition to all councillors signed by a majority of the businesses in Armstrong Street asking for no parklets in their shopping centre and they want car spaces instead. My amendment is not to remove all parklets in the uh, shopping strip but to reduce the maximum number of car spaces for parklets on this street from 14 to eight car spaces. This is to find a balance between the different dynamics and the, of the needs of the diverse businesses that exist here today. The demands of car spaces for traders and residents is greater than the demands for parklets in this village to drive an economic recovery and to further grow. I hope you will support this uh, amendment, not only for the residents, but for the existence of these businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Clark, would you like to speak to it? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have been through um, some challenging processes with um, my end in Canal Ward with um, parklet policies and uh, contentious areas or with traders, uh, mostly traders, and where there's been the challenge has come from the number of parklets or the p potential parklets in the policy being perceived to be too many and the rub is always between the hospitality businesses and the non-hospitality businesses and trying to get that balance right. 
and I think um, we've had feedback from the traders in both of those areas and Council has been very responsive to the feedback that we've received and we've made adjustments in the policy that reflect, I think, better balance uh, once we got that feedback from the Council officers, oh, sorry, from the traders and had those conversations with Council officers. And we reduced the number of parklets uh, in the policy in both Ormond Road and um, uh, Ripon Lee. So out of those conversations and those changes, uh, it was not initially seamless, but uh, as we went through that process, it was seamless and those uh, trading areas are now calm and okay with the numbers and it's well managed uh, within the balance and within the traders and what we have there. So I think the motion here or the motion to re reduce the number of parklets in Middle Park, I'm, uh, Armstrong Street, I'm happy to support that because, as I said, I've been through that process in two other regions. Uh, where it's a small uh, high street, I think that's where the number can be challenging. And if you look, at, I think Carlisle Street has 20-something uh, originally, um, Ripon Lee had about 12. So it is trying to keep a balance of the numbers with the size of the shopping strip. And uh, um, Armstrong Street is a smaller one. And I think the change to eight isn't going to change a single parklet for any of the businesses that have the existing parklets. And I wouldn't want to see uh, that changed. Uh, and it also allows for one more business um, to apply for a parklet if they do want one uh, within that reduced number and it changes nothing for the existing businesses that are there and works in very well in conjunction with now 3.3 that uh, if no one else wants it, then um, the existing business in Middle Park can keep it and, and so they should. So um, for me, I think, it, as I said before, it's about the balance between the hospitality and non-hospitality. In the smallest shopping strips, uh, less has proven to be more with Ripon Lee and Elwood. And I think we've got those balances right with the reductions that we've made and worked with council officers. So that's my perspective on, on why I'd be supporting that. I'm not supporting zero. I don't think that's right. Um, but this number, I think, um, is a good balance. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to speak to this one too. Uh, I 100% support this amendment. I think that Armstrong Street is an amazing street. We're so lucky that there's a true village, a cobbler, an agent, all these things that really make it work. Uh, but that means a lot of people, a lot of different kinds of people come to it. And it has a little bit a yesteryear feel to it. And that's one of the attractions that our older population also feel comfortable there and they drive there a lot. There's also the younger families going to the dance studios and coming through that that's not just within walking area. It's a heavily utilized area. I have concern over the, the old documents, not old, but like previous briefing that got to this number and the number of car parks in general that were used and the percentage and then we got here that it just wasn't contested before. So I feel like it wasn't something that we really got to where we got to on Or Ormond Street. And so this is uh, almost a natural um, number to really go back to what are those, the car spaces available in that village because it goes from Canterbury to Richmond or Richardson, only really one big block of car parks and only four more shops on that the rest of Armstrong Street is all residential. So the bulk of the, I'm not really sure the number, I think someone said it's a lot less than what that original 14 was based on. So I'm very comfortable reducing it to this. And I'm only going to speak to the amendment because that's the point they're on now. The amendment 100% support this. And I hope fellow councillors will too. Anybody else want to speak to the amendment only? Yes, Councillor Miyagi. Thank you, Mayor. Um, look, I've been mulling over this one all week and I've been mulling over this amendment today and I've read a lot of emails from the community. I've heard a lot of feedback from traders, which I was very thankful that Councillor Sirikov took the time to speak to them as well. I think that's really useful for us to make this decision. Ultimately, though, I'm not supportive of this amendment. Um, and the main reason, ultimately, is because I don't think we've actually identified an actual problem yet. We're kind of preemptively trying to solve a problem that doesn't actually exist. Um, I think if you look at the existing situation on Armstrong Street, we have the Middle Park Hotel occupying seven spots and 
That parklet has been a great success in my mind. I drove past there as well um, last time, <laughs> Councillor Vaughan, and I also saw a bunch of people out there enjoying a beer and enjoying a wine. Um, I think that's been a great success and it's not negatively impacted the rest of the shops as far as I can tell, and that's certainly my experience when I go to the IGA or the post office or the, the news agency or any other shops there. Um, and I guess the question then becomes, you know, if we do eight and we continue having um, the Middle Park Hotel, we're only allowing one other parklet for traders. And I understand that traders might not want that now, but I just don't see why we would create a policy and, and then have to come back in six months' time, say, if a cafe opens and they want to have two. It just seems unnecessarily restrictive. Does that mean that we want to have all 14 filled up? Maybe not. Some of these numbers probably are a bit arbitrary, but I'd rather have the tolerance and the policy to allow us to do that in the future. And again, if there's an issue, we can come back to it. We can reduce the number. But I think preemptively reducing the number at this point, when we haven't actually had a problem yet, in my mind, um, seems, seems premature. Thank you. Anybody else speaking to it? Councillor Martin. One of my favourite parts of Port Phillip, Armstrong Street, and luckily I've always, I'm usually able to get a park. When I saw the email starting to come through, I started to doubt my own judgment. When I'd read the document, I, just, I just assumed it was a maximum. But having read the emails, I think some of the people who sent them may have actually inferred that Council wants to put 14 car park spaces into Parkland straight away. It's been clarified that that's not the intention and that if any other business, and there are no businesses at the moment who've given any indication, if there are any other businesses that would like a parklet, they'd need to go through a process to get one. So as, was, as with Councillor Niagui, I'm, I would be uncomfortable about lowering the number from 14 to eight, but I don't particularly want to see 14 parking spots used, used up in Armstrong Street either. On balance, I'd leave it to our officers to decide if there was an application, and there are no applications at the moment, that they'd be able to use their judgment to decide whether or not it was appropriate to add another park. That, but as Councillor Niagui says, we're probably um, limiting our chances to make decisions by putting the eight, but I fully understand why Councillor Sirikos moved the motion. I fully understand why people have been approaching saying, hey, we've got seven, we don't want another, we don't want another um, seven plus seven is four, we don't want another seven now, but there is no intention at the moment to do that, as I understand and it would be left to the discretion of council officers. I'm happy to leave that discretion with the council officers. So much as I'm very sympathetic to Council Sirikov's argument and to the people who've approached us, I won't support the amendment. Anybody else speaking to this? Councillor Pearl? Just quickly, there's no better councillor for Armstrong Street than Councillor Sirikov. So um, with respect, I feel a bit rude by speaking against the motion that Councillor Sirikov's put up against Armstrong Street because she is the... Uh, the expert on Armstrong Street, and there's no doubt about that. Um, I, I think we're over-engineering it, so uh, we should be simplifying it. Even 3.3, I think, over-engineers it a bit. 3.4, I think, over-engineers it. We, we've got enough checks and balances in the policy to be able to allow um, for some flex. If the, 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 all our high streets are changing. Uh, I was very happy to see that the TAB has left and gone, and we've seen that that space has changed. The good thing about Armstrong Street is there is a bit of movement in the retail mix there, and it seems to be uh, thriving, which is a good thing. Uh, the 14 spots may need to flex at some point in the future, and I think the officers within the policy bounds have the judgment to do that. And from our experience where we get it wrong... Um, we're able to change that either through the council chamber or the officers do it themselves. So with a, a deep breath and a bit of courage, I'm going to vote against the Armstrong Street expert. Anybody else speaking to it? Otherwise, we'll go to the vote on the amendment. No? All right. All those in favour of the amendment? All those against? That's lost. All right, we go back to the old motion that is with the 3.3, so 3.4 comes off. 3.3 is still live as part of the entire thing. Now I'll recap, sorry? Oh yeah, you know, sorry. So I'll recap who, sorry, my notes are kind of messy. I believe all the people who have spoken to this is Bond, Martin, and Baxter. Has anybody else, if I've got, yeah, you, you could be next. So now that we're back to this, you still have the one go to speak to it, and Councillor Bond, having moved it, gets a second right of reply. Councillor Pearl? Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. Very happy to support this. 
uh, and strongly encourage your councillors to support it also. I, I always come at things slightly different, and this is how I come at this one tonight. We've done this. We did it right to start with. That's true. Uh, during COVID, and we, we probably don't talk about this much, but there were some very long, hard nights there, and we don't talk about it because it's kind of disrespectful in that what we went through was a, a, a nothing in comparison to what many of our small businesses went through. And... Um, uh, you know, a number of people that went through severe hardship during that period. But what we did do is work as hard as we possibly could to get good outcomes. And we did, um, we made a lot of poor decisions during that time as well. And uh, I supported a number of those, such as cutting back our uh, capital works programs and re reorging in some areas that we shouldn't have reorganised in. And we also wasted, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases on some things that were as... Um, targeted as this one that didn't work. We, we don't talk about those as much uh, because we did do a couple of things that were really right, such as this one. Um, the reason I bring it up is the benefits of strong financial management mean that we can do this the right way. Uh, we, we don't have the financial pressures that particularly one inner city council does and a number of other councillors do, councils do rather, where they can't afford to make um, these generous concessions and these sort of decisions because they have to charge... Uh, crazy amounts of money to their traders to even consider doing these sorts of things. Uh, we're in a good position. We've taken our time. We've done it, taken a policy approach. So far as aware, we're the first council to do it as quickly as we did it. We went hard, we went fast, and it worked. Um, I don't think it was a cabin fever type of project necessarily. I think it's now a, um, a very clear business productivity um, program that the City of Port Phillip runs and there is substantial economic benefit for our local economy and our broader community that's been gained from it. So it's a good thing. Uh, one thing I think we, we should do, and uh, on notice to the CEO that the next council meeting will be asking for an update of how we're going with our civic awards and how our rather small budget allocation to that is going, but we should have a parklet award to award our, our, our best parklet. There, there's some bad parklets around. But Jesus and rippers, like you know, the Saint Ali one is. Um, I went past there the other day, and that's completely different from what it was when it was first put up. And God forbid if that's actually temporary. Um, but there's some real amazing ones, and there's there's uh, some ones that could probably be pulled up as well. But um, yeah, let's uh, let, 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 let's vote this up and um, get on with it. So, and um, you never know, we might be able to. Um, award a wonderful new parklet in Armstrong Street if that's the appropriate thing to do at some point in the future. All right, any else want to speak this? I know it's getting late, so we'll keep comments there, right? Yeah, Councillor Niagui? I'll be brief because I think I spoke on the general motion in a way on the amendment, but I, I um, really like the vivid picture that the Councillor Vaughan painted, and I think it talks to a new normal, and a new normal that involves. Um, lots of alfresco dining and lots of really interesting ways of utilising public space. Um, it's not something I think we all expected in going into COVID that the outcome would be that we'd have all these wonderful outdoor dining areas, but they are really quite wonderful and they've become part of the fabric of our city and they're becoming the fabric of places all around the world. Um, I guess the only question really for me at this point is how we start to look at making these things permanent because um, I think it really is a total shift in the way that we utilise our high streets. Um, I think it's a good one, um, and I, yeah, I think this is a really excellent policy. I'm very excited to support it this evening. Thanks. All right, I'm going to speak to it. I will be voting against this. Now, it's not because I don't love parklets. We're all talking about parklets are the greatest things ever. They are. They're fantastic. But I don't support 3.3. .3. Now, in the officer's recommendation hearing feedback from councillors, that when they have four, if, sorry, if they have more than four spaces, they'd have to just, if there's a, a reason that we've been approached that's too many, they would then ask for justification for why it should be bigger than four. Four is still a lot of, of spaces. There's a lot of different arrangements of four spaces. We have parallel, 45 degree, 90 degree spaces. The square meterage of them is all the same, essentially. Now, um, I think we have, when we have a guideline and a policy, it's very umbrella. We have to look at how would this be applied across all of them. So, for example, 
limiting something, saying if you have outdoor dining already, you can't have a parklet, would be impacting on other ones, such as the SB, which has outdoor dining. But they do benefit from their parklet expanding the space. We we it's generally all right in that one because it's not the frontage is not. I don't know, the fr it works at the SB. It wouldn't necessarily work. For example, at the Middle Park Hotel, where they do have a beer garden. So that application versus ESB, a little bit different. But these guidelines have to be umbrella to kind of cover them all. So I thought that the guide in the report where it said any, any parklet over four, if it wasn't being utilized, would have to prove that it's actually the demand for it. I understand last night, and I'm not trying to make this only about the Middle Park Hotel, but yes, if it's 29 degrees, people are going to go to the parklet, but these parklets are also getting approval to go through winter, and we're going to see no one sitting there. And then there's also the nice 21-degree days that Melbourne pops up often in autumn and spring, and they still have a beer garden, for example. So in the situation of this one, you've already done, you could end up... Go back to it. The... Um, I think it's a measure that the community is asking for, and if we can't do it in the umbrella guidelines, it's the opportunity that bringing that back down, that when there's ones identified as community saying, we think this is too many spaces. Because, for example, Middle Park Hotel, though, why it meets the guidelines is that they have that long street frontage. They also have the street frontage to Canberra Road. So that meets the guideline because it's next to the park. Across the entire Armstrong Street, it's overwhelming to the space, and it's a large number. So I don't want to change the guidelines to say you can only have four spaces everywhere. I don't want to say if you have outdoor dining, you can't have a parklet. All these have packed other ones that work. But that one, the original one, saying that if you have over four, you're going to have to prove that you have the demand to do it. I thought that was a fair balance, and I think that there's been an opportunity taken here to take it out that's only benefiting the Middle Park Hotel saying. I don't think there's any other one that this changes. Now, I don't have the... I asked how many were over four, and it was like five or six, right? So, Blessington Street seems to be one. The SB seems to be one. Middle Park Hotel's one. I don't... Um, maybe the ones, Lenny's, I don't know. I don't know all of them, right? Off the top of my head, should have done the research. But this is the one where it's not impacting on the guidelines. Uh, I think it's a fair balance of the guidelines, essentially, to not include 3.3 as written here, but to have it back in the report as said that if you have over them four spaces, you may be asked to uh, demonstrate the demand, whatever the exact writing was. So I will be voting against this, and I foreshadow that I will move the officer's recommendation should it fail. Okay. Who, anybody else want to speak to the item? Councillor Sirikoff? Yeah, I won't be supporting 3.3 .3 either um, on the same grounds because there would be, could be situations um, in years to come um, in di different areas where a, um, the needs of a parklet is totally underutilised and then does impact upon uh, the rest of a high street um, or other traders who might be new traders who might come to the area. And if they, oh, sorry, no, I'll take that back because a, a parklet cannot be passed on to another person. But if a trader does continue to trade at using a particular parklet and it's underutilised, then I think there should be the the opportunity, whether it's um, by the surrounding businesses or the residents, to say that this is just a nice or it just sits there empty. Um, it's used only, you know, three days of the week instead of seven days of the week. Um, it then takes away the the um, the that 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 space, that amenity, to the rest of the uh, to the rest of the street where uh, customers can come to park. In the, to, to the other uh, traders in the street. So I just think this is an inappropriate amendment or addition of 3.3 .3 to um, this old rec. Thank you. Councillor Crawford? Sometimes it takes making hard decisions in order to get good outcomes, and I think this is one of them. There are guidelines 
there is criteria that our officers will use discretion. There is an appeal process. There are lots of things in the policy. Um, these are guidelines. Uh, we can review it in a year. Let's give it a go uh, and see what other things are possible. There might be a really great business that turns up in the next year in Armstrong Street, just to, to name one, that may benefit from two parklets. I think, again, we're very good at not wanting things in our area. However, once they're there and the change happens, often there is a great benefit. And it's hard to make those decisions and leave people feeling unhappy. I think we make it a few of them tonight. Um, but I'm very supportive. The guidelines are there. Um, there's real opportunity uh, for all of the community to, um, across our city, to make benefit of it. It isn't just about one street. And I think, you know, if there's room, if we need to review in another year, let's give it a go and see what happens. But I think being too prescriptive and too restrictive means amazing possible things can't happen. And we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So I will be supporting this policy. Okay. Anybody else speaking to this? Otherwise, I'll go to the vote. All right. All those... Oh, sorry, Councillor Bond to close. Um, just very quickly, I will close and explain 3.3. Um, I didn't want to see, it was about Middle Park Hotel, I didn't want to see Middle Park Hotel harassed and made to demand and justify their, their very existence by, by this clause being in our parklet guidelines, which is exactly what would have happened down there because you know, we've heard it again and again in all the emails. They just want to get rid of this. They just don't see this as a great addition to our streets. I strongly disagree. This is probably the best thing ever to happen to Middle Park Armstrong Street, is that it's activating the street at night, after hours, when every other or nearly every other business in that street is closed. There's 20, 30 people sitting at the Middle Park Hotel. That is a great thing for Armstrong Street. And I didn't want to see a clause that was inserted into our guidelines used as a way to harass and bully that the owners of those parklets into justifying their existence to a small group of people who just hate change. And I've got that off my chest. There is an inbuilt mechanism in our business parklet guidelines whereby all these businesses are paying for the parklet. They're paying to use them. And if they're not using them, if they're just sitting idle, no business is going to keep paying for that. They will pay for what it is that works. They will pay for what it is that they are activating. If they're not using it, there's an easy way for them to save some money. They just hand it back. And that's what will happen in these instances. And it's whether or not these spaces are financially viable for the businesses that will determine exactly how many parklets they have in many of these instances. And if they're not working for the business, if they're not being utilised, if they're just sitting there idle, the businesses will hand them back and they can go to other businesses in the street or they can return to car parks. But that, that is built within our guidelines, that, that mechanism. It doesn't need us and certain people in the community sitting in judgment over these businesses and criticising their every use and forcing them to justify their existence, which is exactly what I fear would happen if that, if that clause remained. So, and that's all I'm gonna say on these parts. All right, we're gonna go to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? All right, that's carried. Uh, division? All right, all those in favour? All those in favour? All right, Bond, Nyagwe, Pearl, Martin, Baxter, Crawford, Clark. All those against? Sarah Coff and Consola. Okay, motion carried, sorry. All right, um, look, it's probably natural to take another break, but unless someone's asking for it, we're just going to keep going. <laughs> Pardon? All right. Moving on to 12.4, artist engagement services, contract variation. Any questions of the officers on this one? I have a question. Um, sorry, computer's not on. Hey, Adrian, I don't think now's a good idea to raise it. Hey, excuse me, I will ask you to leave the meeting, please. Can you please escort him out? Please don't engage. Okay. 
I can't actually log into my computer. But my question on this item, I believe we're raising it by 150000 Yes, around that. And it said about 45000 a month. I don't have it in front of me. I'm locked out of my computer for a second. But it was 16 more months. Did I get that? So aren't we going to run out of money in three months' time? Uh, through you, Mayor, uh, that's correct. It's approximately 40000 45000 for another 16 months. However, we are going to start a new tender process as soon as possible so that we can offset that risk of it running out before, before we... Okay, yep. thank, you. thank you. Thank you, that clarifies. Thank you. All right, any other questions on this item? Nope. All right, who wants to, do you have a question, Councillor Sierkov? Question or moving? Yeah, yeah, question. I'm just trying to find a question. Um, since this uh, report does not seek any budget increase, um, I'm not quite sure where the additional funds are coming from. Through you, Mayor. So this is um, an upper limit of 15%, which is already existing in the contract. So there's, no, there's not going to be any uh, budget required to go towards it. It's already existing in the contract. So it's an upper limit already built into the procurement system. CEO. Uh, through you, Mayor, what we do is we make best estimates when the contracts are established, but there are a range of budgets across the organisation beyond the events team that are now using these budgets. For instance, the work that we were, which we have budgets for, but at the time they mightn't have been specifically allocated against this contract. So for an example, the work that we're doing around some of our um, street art is now coming through. It wasn't intended to come through this contract when we first set it up, but now this is a very convenient way of paying artists. Um, so that it's within existing overall council budgets it's just that when we set this contract up at the start, we didn't envisage some of the areas that are now using it would be using it. I don't know what's going on. Sorry. Uh, no. Any other questions? No? Yeah, I've got one more question. Um, when we're going through the cost review, um, was this 15% um, was this 15% 15 basically 150,000 um, made obvious to the councillors in consideration of the cost review and where we could find savings? Through you, Mayor, the cost review is about identifying options for reducing service levels. This contract is a way of paying artists who are engaged on various different council activities. Tonight, you're not making a decision around an overspend overall on council budgets or that we have spent money that wasn't initially allocated to council activities. It's just that on this particular contract, we're having more people use it than what we initially anticipated. When it was scoped, it was set up to be used largely for the events, festival and events team. What we're finding is there's other areas of council like our um, street artists program, who are now using it as well. It's not an overspend on overall council budgets. It's just that we didn't forecast that we would use it for all the kind of activities that we now are. So it's not about... You, you will have reviewed, for instance, the service levels around festivals and events. You may have reviewed as part of our graffiti management and street art um, uh, works, which is largely funded through um, state government support. Um, those kind of activities, but this contract in itself is just a vehicle for how we engage people. It in itself isn't a service level. Councillor Clark. Sorry if you covered this, but I just want to make sure I understand. I understand this is paying artists that, or other people that we engage to do a service for the council, but there must be a cost to actually engaging the company to make those payments on our behalf. Is that the million dollars that we pay the company to make those payments or is that what we pay the artists? That's what we're paying the artists. So basically this, this company, through you, Mayor, this company auspices payments to artists which otherwise would be very inefficient and very difficult for us to make ourselves. It ensures that we meet requirements around superannuation for casual payments. 
um, and, and, and does a lot of the paperwork involved in it, but essentially it is all the money going through that organisation to pay the artists as well as their administration fee. All right, thank you. Looking for a mover. Councillor Crawford, looking for a seconder. Councillor Baxter. Councillor Crawford, would you like to speak to it? Reserve. Thank you. Councillor Baxter? Nope. Anybody else? Councillor Crawford? Nope. All right. Let's take it to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimous. Thank you. All right. On to 13.1, Record of Informal Meetings. Now, I need to please note that an amendment to the attachment to this report was made to correct administrative errors with the form. This update will be reflected in the minutes of this meeting. I believe it was just one councillor wasn't marked at a, at a meeting and they were there. So, sorry, was that Councillor Pearl moving it? Councillor Pearl, anyway, seconding. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Speaking to the item? Nope, nope. All right, go to the vote. All those in favour? That's Katie unanimous. Thank you. Moving quickly now. Uh, motion of, so 13.2, motion of Municipal Association of Victoria State Council meeting 2023. Now we have two items on this. The first one is, let me just scroll down. Yep, I'm, I'm just, hold on. Is it, should we take them together or what are we doing? I don't know why they were separate in the first place. Take them together? Take them on block. Okay. I have a question then. Everyone's okay with that being on block? Yeah. All right, thank you. Very informal voting process there. Uh, I have a question that was raised by uh, Speaker Alex Macon about the first item. I can't find my paper. But the question is around the first one, the integrated... Um, thanks. The integrated transport plan... Can you confirm this is a recommendation of the infrastructure of Victoria? Uh, referring to Brian T. Um, yes, through you, Mayor. That's uh, right. Uh, infrastructure Victoria in their Victoria's infrastructure strategy 2021 20, to 2050 um, made the recommendation that the Victorian government develop and publish Victoria's integrated transport plan. Fantastic. So. <laughs> I do trust you. But uh, just wanted to ask if it's too late to add this at this point where we are in the process, if we, someone wanted to make an amendment tonight. Because I know the due date's soon. Um, the uh, MAV process has a deadline that... Um, uh, and that deadline... And this is the last council meeting at which a decision can be made um, in time to meet the MAV deadline. So if the amendment is passed at... Uh, if the resolution is passed at this meeting, um, then that will meet the MAV deadline. OK, thank you. All right. Any other questions? No. Um, all right, then does somebody want to move this or something else? Councillor Pearl? You're moving this, the office is on block. Yeah. Councillor Crawford to second. Councillor Proud, do you want to speak to it? Uh, sure, and a big thank you to Councillor, uh, um, Councillor Baxter for being the representative here. In response to the two items regarding integrated transport plan and the Metro 2, so this council put up a motion, which was motion number 62 in 2018, um, I worked very heavily, heavily on it with then Councillor Gross to, for the MAV to endorse the staging of the suburban rail loop, um, like defer it, and um, bring forward Melbourne Metro 2. And that motion was carried in 2018. So that, and that was this council actually put that motion to the MAV. So that one's covered. Also, the City of Wyndham... Uh, not exactly, but under the integrated transport planning provisions in the 2022 uh, State Council and also support for social planning infrastructure references the integrated, integrated transport plan uh, released on the 4th of August. So there are already, already uh, two existing MAV State Council motion positions that cover 
both of those items. So I don't, I don't think us putting a motion up here this evening that's not fully considered necessarily is the right thing to do, but it's something we could definitely do in the future. Um, and I would also perhaps question the um, effectiveness of the MAV, but perhaps I won't use that opportunity here this evening because the, the, as, a, as a vehicle, well, why not? As a vehicle, it hasn't been in my experience and there's no reflection in terms of our delegate ship, um, quite the contrary. Um, but in terms of an entity, it, it, it's faced some um, struggles as a, as a collective lobby group to get some effectiveness from the government Government, state government, in my experience, there are some things that's done quite well through these motions in the past, and um, Councillor Gross educated me on those, or former Councillor Gross educated me on those. But in, in recent times, my personal experience has been that, that they've been a bit lacking. Um, but that's not because of anything that this council has done. Quite the contrary. Um, w once we paid our membership fee every year, the City of Port Phillip is an active participant and we've always had the highest quality of representation at the MAV State Councils, which is something we should be proud of. So, councillors, thank you for um, the officers putting together the motions as directed by our um, rep, which is Councillor Baxter. So, very happy to support the motion that's going to be submitted on the... 20th of March. Okay. Hold on, just wait. Just wait. Uh, thank you, Councillor Clark. I note for the minutes that Councillor Clark is leaving at 10.17. If you want to share, you have a headache. So fair enough, sorry. Yeah. No, fair enough. Thank you for letting us know. I hope you will let her. Okay, sorry. Uh, clarifying question. Yeah, clarifying question. So we're considering items, for the record, we're considering items 13. The motions arising from 13.2 and 13.5 is one motion, is that correct? Yes, they're taken on block. Yes, so speak to all of them now. Yep. You good on governance over there? Okay. Uh, so we had Pearl speaking to it, thank you. Then Councillor Crawford, are you speaking to it? Oh, look, I just want to say some really good things in here that we obviously need change in the, um, overall. I'm sure many councils will benefit if these can get up at the MAV com um, conference. Yep. All right, anybody else speaking to this? Councillor Martin? Um, and I note that in putting this motion tonight, we're responding in part to some of the queries that were raised at the council meeting two weeks ago. There were people who had issues about Airbnbs. There were people who had issues about earning. There are people who have issues about street safety and some of the motions that we've got here have come out of the discussion that some of us had with some of those speakers at the last council meeting, which I think shows that we're very attentive to the concerns of our community and doing our best to address their concerns. Yep, I'll agree with that. I think we're, it's a late night. Uh, we're not going to debate what we've already debated and all those that were supportive of this going to the MAV. So our next item will be talking about who the new delegate will be to that, and I believe Councillor Nyagu will be our representative going forward. So I hope you have a good learning experience taking these and um, advocating on our behalf, and hopefully they all get up. Anybody else want to speak to the item? No? All right, so we're taking on block 13.2 and 13.5. Uh, all those in favor? That's carried unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think that just leaves 13.3 until we've got a notice of motion. 13.3 um, is appointment of councillors to committees. Please note that the late amendment was made to this report to reflect that a working with children's check is no longer required for members of the Esplanade Market Advisory Committee. This update will be reflected in the minutes of this meeting. Any questions of officers in relation to this report? Being none, do I have a mover of this item? Councillor Martin and Councillor Sierakoff to second. All right, Councillor Martin, not speaking to it. Councillor Sierakoff, not speaking to it. Anybody else? Councillor Bacta wants, wants to speak to it. Just, just want to give a, <clears throat> as, I'm, as I'm coming off some uh, committees, I just want to give a big thanks in particular to um, the Multicultural Advisory Committee, the Multi-Faith um, uh, Steering Network, uh, as being wonderful groups that it's been quite a pleasure to be uh, council delegate uh, on and um, uh, wish uh, all the best to um, councillors Clark and uh, Pearl as they're um, coming on to those ones. Um, and uh, what were the other ones? Um, Councillor Nyagui to the um, Youth Advisory uh, Committee uh, as well. And uh, I'm looking forward to the new appointments. 
Thank you. I'm just going to add, my computer's really stuffed, so I can't see it, but I think that's a good point that people who are coming off it to, you know, reach out and say thank you and when the new roles come on. What's the date the new roles come on? Do we have that? Is that the first? Effective. Effective from now. Okay. All right. We've all done really great work. There's a lot of time and effort that go into these committees, so thank you all for putting your hands up, and I wish you best in the next roles you're in, so thank you. Anybody else speaking to this? No? All right, let's put it to the vote. All those in favor? Thank you. That's carried unanimous. All right, we do still have items. I know you're packing up, but uh, we're going to, that's the end of the re presentation reports. We're going on to notice of motions. Councillors, we have one notice of motion tonight. That's item 14.1, a motion raised by Councillor Baxter in relation to Alma Park West boundary, Alma Park West boundary treatments. Do councillors have any questions of the officers in relation to this notice of motion? If not, well, we would be referring them to you. Councillor Baxter, would you like to move this notice of motion? Yes, please. So, I, Councillor Tim Baxter, um, that will move the motion uh, that Council uh, investigate and report at, and prepare a report on the range on a range of boundary treatment options. It's late uh, at Alma Park West to improve safety of children and dogs leaving the park at Alma Road. Specifically, options to be considered are to include barriers created by either greening uh, trees, garden beds, vegetation, uh, and or fencing. Thank you. Do I have a seconder, Councillor Crawford? All right. Uh, Councillor Baxter, would you like to speak to it? Yeah, I won't take up too much time, but um, we did get a, a flurry of emails after an unfortunate incident with a dog that had been hit by a car on uh, Alma Road. Um, my first uh, instinct, and I, and I do think that this is an important point, is that uh, in dog off-leash areas, dogs should be under the effective control of the um, dog owner at all times, and they should be able to be recalled. Um, having said that, uh, accidents can happen, and uh, there are also um, children that, that uh, may frequent this um, area, although they are more likely to go over to Alma Park East and play on the play equipment there. Um, I do think that it is worth um, uh, investigating some really, I would say, very basic options um, for possible uh, fencing at the boundary uh, where um, the park meets Alma Road, uh, which is a, a major road, although the, the speed limit is um, 50 there, um, just so that uh, it makes the delineation of the boundary much clearer um, and uh, allows for hopefully some, some extra level of, of safety based on that. Um, this, is, this is not a proposal to investigate and prepare a report on a fully fenced uh, dog um, off leash park. Um, it's more just uh, on on that particular boundary. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Um, yeah, look. Part of the joy of Alma Park is that it's quite open. So, look, I'm not sure where I'll end up in the decision around it, but it is worth exploring some options as we have lots of um, passionate pet owners in that area. So, I look forward to the report. Thank you. Anybody want to speak to this item? not. Let's put it to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baxter, for bringing that. Reports by De Councillor Delica Delegates. Councillors, do we have any reports by Councillor Delegates? Councillor Martin, you've got two minutes. I'm giving him I'll be minute. very, very brief. Both come, from the, both come from Housing First, Port Phillip Housing Trust, where I have been your delegate. So today, a number of councillors attended the brand new property at 48 Marlborough Street, where we had the Honourable Julie Collins MP, Commonwealth Minister for Housing, and the Victorian State Minister for Housing, Colin Brooks MP, and we had a tour of it all, and it was just absolutely wonderful. And for those councillors who haven't had a chance to go and have a look, I'm sure the Housing First Board can make an opportunity to have a look. The second thing is, the, uh, there's another, another of the Housing First slash Port Phillip Housing Trust properties, which is the one that the Housing First PPHT have at 6 Tennyson Street, St Kilda, has won, the, has won the Affordable Housing Award at the Urban Development Institute of Australia's Victorian Awards. It's, we, we, it's, it's got the working title Home of Hope, um, one of the jewels in the crown of the Port Phillip Housing Trust, and it's now entered in the <coughs> national awards and the national judging is taking place next week, so hopefully this will be a national winner for Housing First, the Port Phillip Housing Trust and the City of Port Phillip. Thank you. That's very important to add to the record. Much appreciated. Anybody else have council delegate reports? I see no one. Um, urgent business. Councillors, do you have any 
items of urgent business tonight. Nope. Uh, we're now going to move into confidential matters. Councillors, we do have two confidential reports listed on the agenda being 17.1, Procurement of Parking Technology, and 17.2, Palais Theatre and Luna Park Precinct Revitalization Project Update. I now call on a councillor to move that the meeting be closed to members of the public to consider the confidential items. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Second, Councillor Martin. I'll now put that motion to the vote. All those in favour, that's carried unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, Council will now conclude the public part of the meeting. I advise members of the public that there are no further open items to be discussed. This will be the conclusion of the public meeting. Thank you for joining us tonight in person and those online.